Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Um, let me just say, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. I was, I was t telling the, the witnesses, I, I, I have read all the testimony, and I, I generally do that as, as best my ability. Sometimes the, the testimony provided before this committee can be a little dry. And uh, as I'm reading it late at night, it'll put me to sleep. Uh, not so in this case whatsoever. Uh, I think the, 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 the testimony was fascinating, uh, partly because I am somewhat new to this issue. Uh, I'm going to keep my opening statement somewhat brief because I know uh, Senator Booker would like to make an opening statement. I'm happy to have him do so because he's been obviously involved in this issue a whole lot longer than I have. I just want to make a couple brief uh, remarks. And you know, being an accountant, being a business guy, uh, I'm, I'm pretty data-driven. Uh, the data, the statistics on, on this particular problem, the, the Bureau of Prisons and our high levels of incarceration rates are pretty stark. In 1980, for example, uh, there were 25,000 uh, people in, in, the, in the federal prison system. Uh, today, today, today there's 209,000. That's a 736% increase as our population has only increased 40%. Uh, in total, uh, back in 1980, there were about 500,000 uh, people in, in prison. Uh, today there's 2.3 million. Uh, we as, in America have the highest level of incarceration in, in the world. Uh, in 2014 or 2013, it was 716 people per 100,000 population. The next closest uh, country was Rwanda with 492. Take a look at Canada, it's 118. So I, I guess my, my primary comment is when, when you look at those stark statistics and you see, and by the way, I, I had, and I appreciate that uh, Jerome Diller's here from, from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, met with him earlier uh, as part of a group uh, called Nehemiah Project. Uh, a group of individuals, uh, some of them ex-offenders, spending some time in jail, trying to help other people re-enter society. Uh, I remember during that meeting, um, you know, Jerome, how many times did I wince as, 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 as I was being told the stories of how unbelievably difficult we make former offenders, people in jail, to re-enter society. So, the, the purpose of this hearing is to, is to lay out these realities, you know, un understand that uh, what the Bureau of Prisons is, is, is dealing with is an incredibly difficult and complex problem. And, and, and by the way, I, I do have to mention that the testimony by, by Charles Samuels, uh, the current director, I think is also powerful. And he kind of lays out a little bit of the problem in terms of the, the dual mission of, of the Bureau of Prisons. Let me just quick read from his testimony. It's to, the, the dual fold mission is to protect society by confining offenders in prisons and community-based facilities that are safe, humane, cost-efficient, and appropriately secure. And then secondly, to ensure that offenders are actively participating in programs that will assist them in becoming law-abiding citizens when they return to our communities. Uh, that, that's a tough, tough task, and I, I wish I could say I was looking at the statistics and say that, boy, we're, we're really nailing that one. We're really, we've really got this problem solved. We don't. We're a long ways from it. I think. Uh, you know, the testimony will be that in the, in the federal system, we have only, only a 41% recidivism rate, where in state and locals, it's over 60%. You know, I guess when you look at that, it was, we're maybe doing something better on a federal level than we're doing state and local, but boy, that's a, that's a long way from a successful uh, result, and I, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me on that. And uh, I'm not going to steal uh, Ms. Kerman's thunder off of her testimony, but uh, at the very end, I want everybody paying very close attention to the quote she's going to provide from Mr. Thomas Mott Osborne, because I think it really lays out exactly uh, what's at issue here and exactly the question we should be asking as a civilized society. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, my ranking member, uh, Senator Tom Carper. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to thank uh, Senator Booker for uh, encouraging us to hold this hearing, important hearing. Uh, we want to thank all of you for, uh, for coming as witnesses. My day job before I came here to the U.S. Senate was I was privileged to be governor of Delaware for eight years and very actively involved in the National Governors Association. Uh, in Delaware, we don't have uh, sheriff's uh, jails. We don't have uh, uh, county jails or city jails. We have a state uh, correctional system. We have one for adults. We have one for juveniles. Um, in my second term as governor, a fellow named Barry McCaffrey came to, to Delaware. Uh, General Barry McCaffrey retired. And he was, at the time, the nation's drug czar. And he wanted to come and uh, visit a program in the city of Wilmington at Gander Hill Prison. And um, because we were doing a pretty good job in terms of reducing recidivism by about half, from about 75% to maybe 40%. And 
he wanted to find out uh, how we're doing it. He brought with him an ABC uh, camera crew uh, as well. I'll never forget, before he uh, actually uh, went into the prison and, and looked at the program and to see how it, uh, it worked, we went, met with about 50 inmates. And we met in a room much smaller than this room. And uh, they're all in their white uh, garb, and General McCaffrey, myself. And um, I'd been to many of their high schools, or their middle schools, grade schools, their churches, and their, ball, their ball games. And uh, I had some idea of some of them where they knew who I was. And uh, I said to the guys, uh, before we got started on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the program part of the tour, I said to these 50 so guys, most of them, I don't know, 19, 20, 21, 22 years old. I said, how did you guys end up get, getting here? Like, what happened in your lives or didn't happen in your lives that led you here? About five or six guys uh, uh, spoke up uh, before we took our tour, and they all told stories that were uh, uh, very similar. Very similar. I was born before, uh, well, I was born when my mom was young. I never knew my dad. I ended up in uh, kindergarten. Other kids could actually read. They knew their letters, they knew their numbers. I couldn't. I got in the first grade and I started falling behind. In the second grade, and the third grade, and the fourth grade, just falling further behind. And along about the fourth grade, uh, this one guy said, I, I realized if I just act up in class and just be a real uh, nuisance, the teacher would stop calling on me. And so he'd put his head down and, and just stay out of trouble. And, and uh, he said, eventually, though, I'd uh, be put out in the hall by about the fifth or sixth grade. And finally, when I was in the, uh, the seventh or eighth grade, I was suspended from school. And for a while, I said, I like that, because I was no longer embarrassed by how little I knew. And he said, when I was in the ninth grade, I, I got expelled. And I found myself on the outside. And uh, in, in the world, he said, everybody wants to be popular. Guys like me want to be popular. He said, if you're a good athlete, you can be popular in school. If you're smart, you can be popular in school. If you're good with girls, you, you can be popular in school. He said, I was none of those. I was none of those. And he said, I was on the outside. I wanted to feel good about myself. And the only way I could feel good about myself was to uh, take drugs or to consume alcohol. And when I did that, I felt good about myself. He said, I didn't have any ability to pay for those things. I ended up in a life of crime. And I ended up in this prison. Uh, every one of them told the same story. Same story. And the, the fellow who was the uh, commissioner of corrections for me at the time, a fellow named Stan Taylor, wonderful guy, wonderful guy. He used to say to me, we can, uh, you know, 95%, 98% of the people that are incarcerated in our state are going to end up being released and come back into our society. And we can send them back out into society as uh, better people, better parents, or better criminals. And he said, if, uh, it's our choice. It's our choice. And to an extent, it's a choice of the inmate them, themselves. So we're big on root causes in this committee. I'm big on root causes in this committee. And uh, if uh, we take uh, young men, young women, not so young men, not so young women, actually do something about their addictions while they're incarcerated, that's helpful. If we do something about the lack of an education, that's helpful. If we do something about the lack of uh, work skills or actually the ability to get up in the morning and know they have a job to go to, that's helpful. All the above. All the above. The states are laboratories of democracy. We can learn a lot from them, and uh, we can learn from, from one another. Today, we're going to learn from you, and we look forward to this very much. And again, Corey, I just want to thank you for, for suggesting that we be here. Let's, uh, let's have a good hearing. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Carper. Uh, again, I'll ask for unanimous consent to enter my written re uh, opening statement in the record. And with that, uh, Senator Bork Booker. I just want to start by uh, expressing my gratitude to the ranking member and to the chairman for having this hearing. It has been uh, probably the best experience I've had in the United States Senate since I began about 18, 19 months ago uh, to find such bipartisan willingness to deal with issues of justice in our country. It, it's extraordinary from my hour meeting with uh, Chairman Grassley yesterday to being able to sit with you today, uh, Chairman, uh, to see uh, this uh, bipartisan willingness to, uh, to confront uh, the, the wrongs in our country that surround criminal justice and a, and a determination to do something about it. Let me just interject before you go on. You know, and we, we talked about this earlier. I, I was going to do a field hearing in Milwaukee on high levels of incarceration. We didn't do it on that subject because this is so complex, and it was difficult to design the hearing so it wouldn't be inflammatory. Yes. Um, 
so again, I, I appreciate you working with me. So we hold this first one here. But again, this will be first yes. in, in a series. What we end up doing instead is we held a hearing on school choice, which starts really at the beginning part of this, this time spectrum in terms of not providing a, a proper education. Uh, and it ends up leading to this end result in terms of prison. But again, I, I appreciate uh, your willingness to work with me on this, and I'm, I'm hoping at some point in time we can move this uh, discussion into different uh, uh, areas that uh, this is pretty relevant. One of them certainly would be in, in Milwaukee. No, I'm grateful. Uh, again, I'm grateful to you. We've had uh, countless now conversations about criminal justice reform and, and your uh, eagerness, willingness, uh, sincere desire to do something about it has been uh, really encouraging to me in my early months in the Senate. So I'm thankful for that and for this opportunity to be here today. It, it, it is a movement now in our country to do something about it when you have a President of the United States willing to visit a prison, being the first person to do so. Uh, we see that that is a part of our culture. Uh, as a Christian, uh, it says in the Bible, Matthew 25, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was in prison, uh, you came to visit me. This, this understanding that our criminal justice system is not about fear and retribution, but should be guided by principles of justice, fairness, and ultimately redemption. Uh, it, it, to me, that's, that is the American way. But unfortunately, we've gone in a way that so far uh, cuts against our common values and our ideals. This age of mass incarceration on a whole uh, is violating our core principles in so many areas. To have uh, us, uh, as we proclaim to be the land of freedom and liberty, but to have one out of every four imprisoned people on the planet Earth here in the United States of America, even though we only have four to five percent of our population, is a, it runs contrary to our core ideals. To do this at such a massive expense to the taxpayer, unnecessarily egregious expenditures, uh, where we spend about a quarter of a trillion dollars a year incarcerating human beings, many of whom uh, do not need to be incarcerated uh, at the lengths in which they are, runs against our values. When we see our infrastructure crumbling in this country, yet we have the resources between 1990 and 2005 to build a new prison in the United States every 10 days. It run ag runs against our fiscal prudence and our values as a nation. When we see poor people being ground up into a system, but for the fact that they don't have the resources for their liberation, that we have a modern day uh, uh, debtor's prisons in our country that runs contrary to our common values. When we now are at a point in our country where we have literally almost one out of three Americans, between 75 and 100 million Americans, have an arrest record. If we were to go back to the revolutionary times and tell them that there was going to be a government in this land that would be seizing the liberty of almost one out of three people, um, we would definitely have sparked that revolutionary spirit. And now is the time that we need a revolution when it comes to issues of crime and punishment. Now, the chairman was very clear, and I think it's important to restate, that this is a narrow hearing about one specific aspect to begin a process of looking for reforms. But please know, if you look at just our Bureau of Prisons, our federal prison population has expanded 800% since 1980. The Bureau of Prisons now has almost 200,000 inmates, and, 35, and it is 35 to 40% over in capacity employs nearly 40,000 people, and last year in fiscal 2014, the Bureau of Prisons enacted budget totaled an astonishing $6.9 billion. Just working on transportation and commuter rail, seeing the fraction of that we're, we're debating over when we're spending this much. This Bureau of Prisons now is 25% of the Department of Justice discretionary budget. In my very first meeting with then Attorney General Holder, he actually talked to me about the urgent crisis he faces that the Bureau of Prisons is squeezing out his entire budget, taking money away from things that we should be investing in for homeland security, for our protection overall as a citizenry because of this massive explosion. The Bureau of Prisons is so large that it is absolutely critical that we in Congress, this committee, exercise our oversight to ensure that taxpayer bought dollars are being spent wisely, especially in light of what many states are showing, that you can reduce your prison populations dramatically, saving taxpayer dollars and lowering crime at the same time. 
So make no mistake, I, I, as a mayor, I learned that you have to make sure that when a crime is committed, that there is a punishment and people get a proportional punishment. But I'm troubled by some of the practices that are obviously failing to live up to our common values and just do not make in any way economic sense as well. And so I'm grateful for this hearing. There are some areas which I think we really need to drill down that are in those small areas that we can make improvements now that can, Mr. Chairman, make a big difference. One of them is solitary confinement, known in the Bureau of Prisons as segregated housing units. It's a practice that many people, medical professionals, human rights activists, civil rights activists, indeed other countries consider torture because of its impact. Prolonged use of solitary confinement on an inmate often results in severe psychological harm. Justice Kennedy, in a recent Supreme Court decision, questioned the constitutionality of this punishment, saying the penal system has a solitary confinement regime that will bring you to the edge of madness, perhaps madness itself. The medical community confirms that reality. It is time that the federal government acts uh, as a model to ending this practice of solitary confinement. Also, Congress gave the courts the authority to release prisoners early for extraordinary compelling reasons, known as compassionate release. The Bureau of Prisons has the ability to release prisoners now that are facing imminent death or serious incapacitation. The data is clear on this population. They are not a threat to our safety and our community, and they are costing taxpayers extraordinary amounts of money. This is a compassionate release program that is properly named and should be explored. And then Attorney General Holder issued guidelines to allow the Bureau of Prisons to expand the pool of applicants who may be considered for compassionate release. This is something we should look at. Finally, I hope that we can explore what programming the prison, Bureau of Prisons provides to those that are the least of these in our society, those that are often marginalized. And I'm specifically talking about those who are suffering from mental health challenges uh, and drug addictions. Right now, states across America are struggling to control, for example, a growing heroin epidemic. And many of these people are finding themselves addicted in a federal system that does not adequately treat them. Uh, the Bureau of Prisons must find a way to insist inmates who are struggling with addiction and with mental health. Again, I want to thank you, Chairman. This is a, a hearing that I've been very excited about. I want to thank our witnesses. I especially want to thank Charles Samuels, who has met with me personally, who we've had great conversations with. His, his tenure is actually coming to an end, uh, but he is a dedicated public servant uh, representing uh, the administration, and I know they are committed to reforms and have a record of, of making some progress on these issues that, that I have outlined. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Booker. And again, we, we all want to thank the, the witnesses and, and welcome them. It is the uh, tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses, so if you all rise and, and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you will give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Our first witness is Ms. Piper Kerman. Uh, she is the author of Orange is the New Black, a memoir about her experiences in federal prison. She is also a board member of the Wi Women's Prison Association, which works to promote alternatives to incarceration to women. Ms. Kerman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member, and members of the committee, I appreciate you inviting me here today. In my memoir, Orange is the New Black, I recount in detail the 13 months that I spent incarcerated in the federal prison system, with most of my time served at the Federal Correctional Institution in Danbury, Connecticut. I have worked with many women and men who are returned citizens like me, and we all want to get back on our feet to reclaim our rights of citizenship and to make positive contributions to our communities. Our experiences are essential to understanding the reform that's needed in our criminal justice system so that it will provide for public safety in a way that is legal and humane and sensible. And that's why I'm here today. Women are the fastest growing population in the American criminal justice system. And their families and communities are increasingly affected by what happens to women behind bars. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 63% of women in prison are there for a nonviolent offense. Many are incarcerated due to substance abuse and mental health issues, which are overwhelmingly prevalent in prisons and jails. 
and the rate of sexual abuse and other physical violence that women experience prior to incarceration is staggering. Female prisoners suffer these problems at greater rates than male prisoners, and these experiences are relevant both to their crimes and to their incarceration. But these issues are not being adequately addressed by the Bureau of Prisons. The research on criminal justice involved women and girls shows that the risk factors I mentioned require different approaches in order to reduce women's recidivism and result in successful reentry. This is not unlike findings in other fields, such as healthcare, where research shows that women experience heart attack symptoms quite differently from men, and their treatment needs differ. And this understanding has saved women's lives. The Bureau of Prisons should adopt gender responsive correctional approaches that interrupt cycles of unnecessary suffering. States like Washington provide a roadmap to do this successfully. When I was locked up in Danbury, I knew women who were trying to raise their children during brief reunions in the visitor's room while fending off sexual harassment and struggling with addiction and trying to get a high school education so that when they got out, they stood some chance of surviving despite their felony conviction. I saw women in Bureau of Prison Prisons <laughs> denied necessary medical care and women with mental health issues wait for months to see the one psychiatrist who is available for 1,400 women. And that's unimaginable in a system where at least 65% of women experience some kind of mental illness. Equally shocking were the mandatory reentry classes inmates took to prepare to leave prison. I attended one on housing, which was led by a man who worked in construction in the prison. And the, the mostly poor and overwhelmingly minority women who were attending that class desperately wanted to know how someone with a felony conviction and few resources could find safe, affordable housing to live in after release. And instead, we heard about, um, we heard about fiberglass insulation and roof maintenance and some other home improvement tips. The reentry health classes that we took were taught by a culinary department officer who had no expertise or information on reproductive health, mental health, or substance abuse options post-release. He had, however, played professional baseball for a brief time, and hence his authority on the health topic. Many of Danbury's policies were questionable, but it was relatively close to home for most of the women who were serving time there. Families could visit, children could see their mothers, many of whom were raising their kids on their own before being sent to prison. Yet, the BOP disregarded this when it chose to convert Danbury FCI to a men's facility in 2013. This sent women beyond the BOP's stated goal of no more than 500 miles from home, and it has also deprived many of them of programming that male prisoners enjoy, such as Unicor employment, which is very important, or the residential drug and alcohol treatment program, which not only is one of the most effective programs the BOP has, but also is one of the only ways to earn a sentence reduction in the Bureau. It is worth noting that the desire to empty that prison of women caused the Bureau of Prisons to examine prisoners' sentences and exercise its discretion granted by the Second Chance Act, signed into law in 2008 by President Bush. Hundreds of women were reassigned to complete their sentences in halfway houses or even in home confinement. And while briefly exercised in the case of Danbury FCI, the BOP has not used its authority under the act to safely reduce the federal prison population and return as many prisoners as possible to their communities. The BOP should place all eligible prisoners in halfway houses or home confinement at the earliest possible dates and should use compassionate release and sentence reduction programs. And this would help relieve the persistent overcrowding and keep staff and prisoners safer while reducing costs. Finally, the BOP must be led by individuals who value the role of communities and families in rehabilitation and understand the particular needs of women. We appreciate the service of Director Samuels, and he leaves at the end of this year. 
He should be replaced by a leader who is committed to enacting these values into policy. I urge the administration to look outside of the existing bureau leadership for strong candidates who will make the BOP a model system driven by innovation and creativity. I close with the words of the legendary reformer and warden of Sing Sing Prison, Thomas Mott Osborne, who famously asked, shall our prisons be scrap heaps or human repair shops? Today, with the biggest prison population in human history here in the United States, we must insist on a different answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kerman. Our next witness is Mr. Jerome Dillard. Mr. Dillard is the jail reentry coordinator for Dane County, Wisconsin. He also served as the director of Voices Beyond Bars, a group aimed at helping former inmates transition in the community by offering employment and computer classes. And Mr. Dillard, I just want to thank you for traveling here from Wisconsin for your testimony. Please. Thank you, uh, Senator Johnson. Uh, in opening, I want to thank this committee for having me. Uh, I want to thank you, Senator Johnson, and. Uh, my other senator from Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin, uh, for uh, having me sit before you today. I sit here uh, as a formerly incarcerated citizen who served time in both federal and state prison systems. My crimes were nonviolent, um, driven by a long history of drug addiction. While doing time in prison, I witnessed a system that was ballooning with predominantly young African Americans who were serving long prison sentences, 10, 20, 30 years for drug crimes. This was troubling to me, seeing so many young men losing the prime of their lives to the criminal justice system. Uh, it was, while doing time, I made a strong determination that I will do all I can to stay out of our prison system. I've been out roughly 19 years now, and I've had the opportunity to share my own journey of recovery at correctional uh, centers, uh, educational institutions, conferences, and in the community. Given my personal account on how peer support uh, directly aided in the success of my recovery with regards to substance abuse and mental health. We often don't think of the formerly incarcerated citizens as assets in the work uh, being done to address the issues of incarceration. The power of peer-led groups and, and organizations provides so many essentials needed for the successful reentry of individuals returning to our communities. An in-house prison support network of this type would be helpful for the process of rehabilitation. Some of the barriers uh, to creating this sense of community uh, opposition from the Bureau of President prisons and the state prisons staff with fostering that us and them mentality. Real cultural competency training would be a value in all prison systems. I want to say in the work that I do, I realize that the barriers are tremendous. For uh, individuals returning to the community from state and federal prisons are often faced with huge amounts of debt, uh, child support, restitution, supervision fees, and on and on. Uh, real barriers to individuals who are uh, oftentimes subjected to the lower paying jobs that are available in our communities. I was given an opportunity to work in a mental health AODA prison in our state. This is a, re a unique facility that is invaluable because they provided mental health and trauma-informed care to, on an individualized basis. What I witnessed there and the programming that went on there, uh, I can't say enough about. Because traumas are so prominent with this population. As I talk to these men, many, uh, and often I ask how many men uh, had, a, had their fathers in their lives. And the majority of the times, these individuals uh, would say, my father was in prison, or I don't know my father, and I, I was raised by the streets. These, these are some of the traumas. Even fatherlessness is a trauma that usually goes un, uh, unaddressed. And for those in our inner cities, they're humongous. They're huge. 
Um, in the time that I have, I, I really can't elaborate on many of the things I'd like to say, but I'm going to say this in closing. In working with our incarcerated and formerly incarcerated citizens over a, a decade now, I'm beginning to see a shift in confronting mass incarceration. It's an issue that both political parties agree on, that Amer America's addiction to mass incarceration is not working. It's costly. It does not restore people. And I personally feel that the climate is right and the ground is fertile for real criminal justice reform. The modern war on drugs produced an overall prison population that remains unprecedented in world history. At the federal level, the growth in the incarceration rate has been even greater and more sustained than, any, than in the states. I am encouraged by some of the initiatives that are taking place in the, on the local level in many states and counties. In my county, we are working to address the racial disparities and reduce the number of those incarcerated at all levels of the criminal justice system. And great works are being done addressing these problems. And I feel that addressing these problems will require far, require far more tinkering with uh, than tinkering with the sentencing policies of nonviolent offenders or revamping prison programs. To achieve a reasonable level of incarceration, we will need to substantially reduce both the numbers of people admitted to prison and the length of their sentences. In making a suggestion, I would like to say to the Department of uh, the BOP should continue to solicit feedback from people who are serving time so they can craft programming that's to the prison population. The BOP programming needs to match labor market data about high growth industries. It also needs to be specific to the regions. And last of all, the BOP needs to advocate to Congress for laws that allow more merit time, early release, and incentives for good behavior or programming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dillard. Our next witness is Udi Ofer. Uh, Mr. Ofer is the Executive <coughs> Director of the American Civil, Civil Liberties Union in New Jersey. <laughs> Through his work at the ACLU, he has worked on the state level to form a blueprint on how to reduce the prison population <coughs> in New Jersey. He worked closely with Governor Chris Christie to pass bail reform legislation, which takes effect in 2017, and is estimate, estimated to reduce the prison population in New Jersey by about 8,500 inmates. Mr. Ofer. Thank you, Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member <clears throat> Carper, and members of the committee. My name is Udi Ofer, and I'm the Executive Director of the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey. And it is my honor and privilege to be here today on behalf of the ACLU and the more than one million supporters of our supporters living across the United States, including in New Jersey. Today's hearing comes at a critical moment in our nation's history when there is a rare opportunity to take bold action on criminal justice reform. Republicans and Democrats alike are taking a second look at our nation's criminal justice system. And Republicans and Democrats alike are becoming much more pragmatic and much less ideological in their approach to criminal justice. Following decades of punitive policies that have sent millions to prison and devastated communities, particularly low-income communities of color, Americans are now realizing that our nation's prisons and jails have grown too big and that all too often, the people who end up imprisoned really suffer from drug addiction or mental illness and should not be incarcerated in the first place. We all know the story of the growth of our nation's incarcerated population, our nation's jails and prisons hold almost 2.3 million people on any given day. The federal prison population has increased from 25,000 prisoners in 1980 to more than 207,000 today. And all of this comes at an annual cost to taxpayers of tens of billions of dollars. But the costs have far more severe consequences than simply the fiscal expenses necessary to incarcerate 25% of, of the world's prisoners in a country with 5% of the world's population. The true costs are human lives, and particularly generations of young black and Latino men who serve long prison sentences and are lost to their families and, in, and to their communities. And the fact is that African Americans and Latinos are disproportionately engulfed in our broken criminal justice system. 
So it is clearly time for a change. We are at a crossroads as Americans recognize the need to reform both our federal and state criminal justice systems. So with this in mind, I come before you today to urge you to seize this opportunity to reform prison practices, reduce the incarcerated population, and create a system that is smarter, a system that is fairer, and a system that is more cost effective. And at the top of any reforms of federal prison practices must be the issue of solitary confinement. Approximately 5% of federal prisoners are in solitary confinement. That means that on any given day, 11,000 people in federal prisons, 11,000 people are confined to a six by nine cell and deprived of basic human contact with little to no natural light and minimal, if any, constructive activity for 22 to 24 hours a day. In some federal facilities, the average time that a prisoner sits in continuous solitary confinement is four years. You need to look no further than the front page of today's science section of the New York Times, and it's the science section, not the politics section, to get a better understanding of the mental and physical consequences of long-term solitary confinement. And according to a, a recent independent review of the federal prison system solitary practices, there are major problems. Federal prisons send thousands of seriously mentally ill individuals into solitary confinement, people who should be receiving treatment, not sitting in the hole. And federal prisons use solitary and close to 1,400 people who are there for protective custody, protective custody, but instead are subjected to virtually the same conditions as prisoners are in solitary for punishment. So what can we do about this? Well, there are many small yet important steps that the Bureau can take today and that are outlined in the independent review. Yet the truth is, if all that we take today are small steps, then we will have lost this historic moment for bold change. Now is the time for historic change. Solitary confinement has no place in American prisons. Physical separation may sometimes be necessary for safety and for security, but isolation is not. Therefore, we call on the Bureau of Prisons and we call on the Congress to resolve this issue once and for all. First, it's time to abolish the use of solitary confinement for persons under the age of 18 and for persons with mental illness. Senators Cory Booker and Rand Paul have already introduced legislation, the Redeem Act, which would prohibit the use of solitary confinement on juveniles, and we fully support this legislation. Second, for all other prisoners, the Bureau should abolish periods of solitary confinement lasting longer than 15 days, period. We believe that implementing these recommendations will lead to a smarter and more humane system and will lead to a decrease in the federal prison population by reducing recidivism rates. Finally, a couple of quick words about New Jersey. Given the focus of this hearing on BOP practices, the lessons from New Jersey are not directly applicable, but there are some important lessons worth mentioning. New Jersey is not a perfect model. We, we have terrible solitary confinement practices, but there are some things that we've done well. In 1999, New Jersey's incarcerated population peaked at more than 30,000. Today, it is at about 21,000, a 30% reduction in a decade and a half. How did we achieve it? We achieved it, we achieved it through numerous policies, with the biggest ones being changing our harsh mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenses and a decrease in the number of, of parolees returned to prison for technical violations. And as mentioned by Senator Johnson, we recently had a major victory in a bipartisan manner working with Governor Christie to overhaul our state's uh, bail system, which we believe will lead to thousands of fewer people sitting in jail simply because they are poor. Uh, poor. So look, nationwide, the bipartisan commitment to criminal justice reform is as strong as it will ever be. So the ACLU urges the Congress to take bold action to adopt our recommendations, which would help to increase, increase fairness and justice at every stage in the system. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ofer. And, and I do want to stress, you, you've mentioned the word bipartisan a number of times, and it's just true. You know, certainly the focus of this committee has been you know, describing problems and look for the areas of agreement. And this is something I think that we've got broad, broad agreement on. This, this system isn't working, as, as Mr. Dillard pointed out. It's just not working. We have to take a look at the facts 
and uh, admit that, that uh, harsh and stark reality. Uh, Ms. Kerman, you, you obviously have a pretty unique story here. Um, you didn't spend much time in your testimony. Um, maybe people more tied into pop culture uh, fully understand, but if you could just quickly describe uh, you know, what you were put in prison for. And at the tail end, I'd also like you to tell me what do you think your punishment should have been? Hmm. Uh, thank you for your question, Senator Johnson. Um, I was, uh, when I was uh, in my early 20s, which is a very typical risk time for folks to be involved with crime or to commit a crime, uh, I was involved with a relationship with someone involved with narcotics, and I carried a bag of money from Chicago to Brussels in support of, you know, a drug trafficking enterprise. Um, I voluntarily left that situation, you know, good sense kicked in. I was very fortunate. I had a college degree already. I, you know, had many... Uh, benefits and privileges. And so I was able to return to the United States and to get my life back on track and to put uh, any involvement in crime behind me. Uh, many years passed before I was indicted in the federal system and ultimately I was sent to prison 10 years after I committed my offense. Uh, I pled guilty to my crime very swiftly. I was very fortunate to only serve uh, 13 months of a 15 month sentence. One of the things that was so striking to me um, the very first day that I spent in prison was that so many of the women that I was incarcerated with, who I would spend a great deal of time with, were serving much harsher sentences than I was. And as the days and the weeks and the months went on, and I came to know those other women really well, it was impossible for me to believe that their crimes were so much more serious than mine. In fact, the only conclusion I could draw was that they had been treated much more harshly by the American criminal justice system than I had been treated because of socioeconomic reasons, differences in class, and in some cases, because of the color of their skin. Uh, I left the, the custody of the Bureau of Prisons in 2005. I had two years of supervised release, probation, uh, which I completed successfully. When I reflect on the punishment for my crime, I certainly cannot protest it when I think about the harshness with which poor people and disproportionately poor people of color are treated in this country. It's hard, however, to believe that there was a lot of social benefit to the community drawn from my incarceration. It prevented no new crimes. I think particularly when we consider uh, the punishments that we have meted out for drug offenses, we have to reflect on the enactment of these mandatory minimum drug sentencing laws, generally in the mid 80s. Uh, at that time, you know, I think that those laws were intended to curb substance abuse and addiction and some of the crimes that grow out of substance abuse and addiction. Today, many decades after we passed those laws, we've put millions and millions of Americans in prison and saddled them with felony convictions. And today, illegal narcotics are cheaper, they are more potent, and they are more easily available than when we put mandatory minimum sentencing laws on the books and incarcerated all those people. I think we can only draw the conclusion that in terms of curbing substance abuse and addiction, that those laws are a failure, and that locking people up for drug offenses, uh, particularly low-level nonviolent drug offenses, is a huge waste of time and money. So, so let me go back to my, what I wanted you to answer the final question, though, is I agree, it, it's not working. Mm -hmm. I think there's two reasons for prison, punishment and deterrence. Mm -hmm. So what, what type of punishment is appropriate and that would deter people from, for example, trafficking drugs to young people, which is, is pretty damaging for society. I mean, what, what do you think would be the alternative? Have you, have you given that any thought? I think that a very appropriate part of my punishment, if it was not confinement in a prison, would have been a lengthy term of community service, working with people who are addicted to drugs and with families that are suffering from the ravages of addiction. What I experienced while I was incarcerated was very intense, close friendships with women whose lives had been devastated by substance abuse and addiction. And that really brought home to me the harm of my own actions. And I think that that's uh, one of the most appropriate ways okay. to, to deal with 
good, those good, kinds of harms. Good answer. And very briefly, because I want to get to Mr. Dillard as well. The other women that were in prison, it's, I know you don't have the stats on it, but in general, what were, were they there for also just basically drug crime? Oh, in particular, the vast majority? In both state and federal systems, but overwhelmingly in the federal system, women are incarcerated for nonviolent drug offenses um, and for property crimes. But in the federal system, I mean, I think if, if any member of this committee had the opportunity to meet the hundreds of women that I did time with, you would probably walk away from getting to know those women with a deep feeling that their confinement in a prison cell or a prison facility was just a colossal waste and not an appropriate way of intervening in the things that, that put them into the criminal justice system. Thank you. Mr. Dillard, obviously we met in discussions about the difficulty of reentering society after you've served your time. Talk about the challenges. I mean, you were talking about the, the huge debt levels. Uh, you're sitting in prison and your, your child support just continues to uh, build. And then you, you get out. It's very difficult to find a job. And one of the things I'm working with Senator Booker on is they ban the box for federal employees okay. to serve as an example. So hopefully something like that would work to give people the opportunity to get a job. But even if you get a job, a lot of these are entry level. They, they don't pay a whole lot. And yet we expect uh, people who just get out of prison, prison to all of a sudden start paying off those debts, and then describe what happens when they're unable to. Well, the fact is, um, when, when you're faced with these barriers, and I too uh, came home faced with many barriers, uh, the fact is I had support, I had individuals who kept me encouraged, and I had someone to give me an analogy, and that was putting a little bit behind you at a time. I was fortunate to be able to obtain a living wage uh, employment about a year and a half after being out. Uh, that was helpful because after 13 years, I finally got a tax return. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, that analogy of putting that debt behind you a little bit at a time is something that I teach to, to young men today. Mm -hmm. The fact is uh, many of our young people uh, have ties to the criminal justice system. And there's so much hopelessness uh, that comes with uh, being tied to the criminal justice system that often they feel that there's no place for them in the workforce. Um, application after application, turn down after turn down, because in many instances uh, of your criminal convictions, uh, individuals lamp into hopelessness. And from there, uh, addiction can, can, can raise its ugly head, or hustling, addition, uh, 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 or just uh, becoming part of the norm in, in many of the communities that uh, have had to resort to uh, these things. Again, in, in our meeting, one of the individuals we were talking with you know, spoke that not paying child support ends up being a parole violation. Yes which lands you right back in jail, correct? Mm -hmm. Which costs us you know, $33,000 for, for a male prisoner. I think uh, Ms. Kermit isn't about $50,000 for a female prisoner. Mm -hmm. so, so here, you know, it, again, it's these enormous challenges just trying to re reintegrate in society, get a job, and then when you're unable to pay off your child support, which again, we, we all want people to be responsible and pay mm -hmm. for their children, mm -hmm. but then you, you land right back in jail. Is, is that? That's, that's well, what I heard. Is that basically true? Well, in, in some cases. But the fact is, child support continues to accumulate even while you're doing time. Um, I, I had a gentleman who was released from prison after 15 years. Sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 in jet, debt with child support, um, along with all the other things that came. The only employment that he can find was uh, uh, working in a fast food restaurant at a minimum wage. And after taking home uh, his second paycheck, he was like, I can't make it like this. I just can't. Uh, you know, over 40% uh, of his check was being taken before he even got it. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's a, a discouragement, really, uh, for him to continue working at a minimum wage uh, position and not be able to pay rent or have transportation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dillard. I'm, I'm out of time. Senator Carper. Chairman said uh, a few minutes ago there are two reasons for prisons, punishment and deterrence. 
I'd say there's at least one more, and that is to try to correct behavior so that when people come out, be, be less likely to uh, recidivate and simply commit crimes again and, and, and return to, uh, to our prison. I mentioned earlier, uh, Stan Taylor was Commissioner of Corrections when I was governor for my second term, and the, his words uh, still ring true today. Um, the overwhelming majority of people who are incarcerated are going to come out someday. They're not there forever. They'll come back into our society, into our communities, and they can come out as better people or they can come out as better criminals. And uh, Cory Booker, Senator Booker, alluded to a moral imperative that we face, whether people of faith or not. He alluded to Matthew 25, uh, when I was hungry, when I was thirsty, when I was naked, when I was sick and in prison, did you come to see me? I've been in every prison in Delaware. We transformed Ferris School, which really was a juvenile prison, into a real school. And uh, I have given this uh, matter huge amounts of, of time and, and thought over the time that I was there and even, uh, even now. Um, in the National Governors Association, we used to say, and I would say to my cabinet, when we have cabinet meetings, uh, dealing with a particular issue, I'd say, somebody, some governor in some state has dealt with this issue, figure out how to deal with it and do so successfully. We gotta find that state, that governor, and whoever worked on this particular challenge in that state. A lot of what we're talking about here, somebody's done something really good and uh, they can serve as a model. States are laboratories of democracy. And uh, before we go off for the Bureau of Prisons, just starting from scratch, we need to, uh, to, to look around our country and say, well, where are some states that are doing some things really well? Uh, in our state, we changed the juvenile uh, uh, prison into a real school. In our state, we, uh, we decided to, when we had people in prison, we're gonna have them for a while, why not work with them on their educational skills? Actually create a school within the prisons to work with them on their drug addictions, to, to for, give them an opportunity, wh whatever faith they might be, but to actually uh, exercise their faith, learn about their, their faith, to prepare for transformation, to learn skills, whether it's uh, upgrading computers, whether it's uh, building furniture, whether it's uh, learning auto repair, and literally taking the whole fleet for the state of Delaware, the car fleet, and basically provide maintenance in our prison system so that people at least have that kind of skill when they, when they walked out. What I'd uh, like to do is to, to ask uh, each of you to give us one like, terrific example. Could be in a state or a local uh, correctional system. One terrific example within the system, within the prison itself, or frankly without. Because if, if, we don't, if we don't do a lot better job on the, on the early side, the early, the early childhood side and, and, and so forth, uh, we're, we're not really going after the root cause. But just give, me, give us one good example. Could be uh, um, in, the, in the correctional system, it could be before, it could be after release. Do you think we ought to really, uh, really drill down and, and try our best to emulate? Thank you. Uh, Ms. Kerman. Thank you, Senator Carper. Um, I currently teach nonfiction writing in two state prisons in Ohio. And one of those prisons is a men's medium security prison. There's, uh, it was built for 1,400 men. It currently houses 2,600 men. It is led by a young warden who is trained as a social worker at OSU. He does things differently than any prison I've ever stepped foot inside. Uh, the prison has more lifers than any other prison in the state of Ohio. It, has, uh, it is one of two prisons with the lowest violence rate in that prison. So uh, that is a big change over time in that facility. Um, that warden and his predecessors have done a great job at making that a much safer prison. And that warden has, um, and his staff, have a tremendous amount of rehabilitative programming of every sort, whether it's vocational, educational, spiritual. One of the first programs that was ever in, uh, put in place there back in the 90s was an interfaith dorm where prisoners of different faiths would come and live in that dorm for one year, do a special curriculum, learn how to deal with each other and their differences, and then go back out into general population as change agents. Um, that prison is a really interesting place, and that warden's philosophy and, and the philosophy of all of his staff, because one man cannot do it all, all of his staff need to be on board for him to do that, is really inspirational, I think. 
I want to make a note on uh, some of the results that that prison gets. Uh, back to Udi's testimony Skirman, on solitary Skirman. confinement. Yeah. yeah, I would like to listen to you for the rest of the morning, but I only have two, two more minutes, so I'm going to ask you just to just hold it right there if you okay. want. And uh, we'll hopefully have a second round, and we'll come back and finish okay. it. I would note this. I, I'm an Ohio State graduate undergrad. And uh, the, uh, one of the things that attracted me to the, uh, the Key Quest program, which we instituted in our adult prison uh, system at the Gander Hill Prison, that uh, uh, Barry McCaffrey, Nations Drugs Art, came to see. The guy, the guy who developed, helped us develop that and implement it in Delaware was Jim Enciardi from Ohio State. Mm -hmm. It literally came out of, uh, out of, uh, uh, out of Columbus, Ohio, and, uh, and frankly, it worked pretty well. Uh, Mr. Dillard, same question. Give us just one great example. Piper's given us one. Give us one as well. Well, I... I personally feel that uh, the work is on the offenders themselves. Um, and that is, uh, when I, you know, it was a lifer who really made a difference in my life, who spoke life into me. And throughout the pris my prison sentence, uh, I realized how the older inmates uh, really work with and try to encourage younger, the younger ones. Um, I still feel that, you know, you can't leave formerly incarcerated citizens out of the equation. Ms. Rofer? So if I may, I'm gonna give two quick examples. Go ahead. One is solitary confinement, since that was the focus of my testimony. There are examples of states that have dramatically reduced solitary confinement without causing risk to staff and to, and to inmates. And a good example is Colorado. In 2011, Colorado placed in solitary confinement about 7% of its incarcerated population. Today, it's about 1% of its incarcerated population. We've seen a dramatic uh, decrease in the use of solitary by banning the use of solitary against some vulnerable populations like people with serious mental illness and by restricting the number of days that you could be sent. So that's one. The second example is bail reform and what we've done in New Jersey and what other states and some municipalities are looking at. In New Jersey, we had 10,000 people sit in jail for, awaiting their trial because they couldn't afford a few thousand dollars in bail. We have completely revamped that system where now your bail, um, and whether you're gonna be released pretrial or not is be determined by your risk assessment and not by whether you are poor or rich. We believe that that change in and of itself will lead to about three quarters of the 10,000, so, you know, seven to 8,000 fewer people sitting in jail. Before this reform, the average time that, it, that a person sat in jail awaiting their trial was 314 days. These are people that are presumed innocent until proven guilty, and they were being treated like guilty. And this is a phenomenon all over the country, and this is one of the ways that we can dramatically reduce our jail population in the United States. Let me just close by saying this. I, I, Senator Rook and I talked about what, what, the moral imperative that we have in this country to look out for the least of these. We also have the fiscal imperative. And while our budget deficit's down a lot, it's still substantial. And we have a fiscal imperative to meet the moral imperative in a fiscally responsible way. Hence the need to find out what is working, do more of that, find out what is not working, and do less of that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Carper. Before I turn it over to Senator Booker, because you, you mentioned my name and uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't quite get it right, I, I said, that jails, we, we jail people to punish and to deter. But then I also fully mentioned the mission statement of the Bureau of Prisons uh, to ensure that offenders are actively participating in programs that will assist them in becoming law-abiding citizens when they return to our communities. And of course, I highlighted Ms. Kerman's testimony where she quoted Thomas Mott Osborne, shall our prisons be scrap heaps or human repair shops? I strongly hope that our goal is that they're human repair shops. So with that, to Senator uh, Booker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Udi, let's jump in real quick. Um, so solitary confinement, can, can you please describe this? Because as I've had these conversations with friends and others, people often think that solitary confinement is a result of them, someone having done something wrong in prison. And it, why is solitary confinement so, uh, so commonplace? Is it because prisoners are, are doing things wrong in prison? Well, you know, we've seen as a nation a dramatic increase in the use and reliance on solitary over the last couple of decades. We don't have exact, reliable scientific data since we actually do a terrible job as a country tracking how many people we place in solitary, but there is consensus that its use has increased dramatically, particularly in response to overcrowding. 
um, and where uh, prison officials are overwhelmed and their quick reaction is to send people to the hole. So we have examples from New Jersey, we have examples from around the country of people being sent to solitary for things like talking back. I'll give you a New Jersey example out of, out of uh, New Jersey State Prison in Trenton where an inmate, inmate by the name of Sean Washington in 2013, um, he was a clerk at, a, at the library um, and he wanted to leave the library to go bring some legal papers to one of the other inmates. Yet a corrections officer said, you cannot leave. And the facts here are a bit disputed, but the worst facts, the facts that the state claims, is that Mr. Washington then said, mother effer to the correction officer, don't tell me what to do. That's the worst facts. What was his punishment? 90 days in solitary confinement. That is a real example. Those are examples that we see all across the nation. You know, for- okay, so I'm, I'm just wondering, just for time. So we, we know that people are being sent to solitary for many different reasons. Right. Some of them have to do with uh, administrative issues and the like. Um, does it work in terms of, uh, in somehow uh, affecting uh, the behavior of right. Is this something that is any productive value right. in, uh, in, in the Bureau of Prisons? Well, I'm going to push back for a second on, on some language that you use, and Please. that is some people are sent back, are sent to solitary for administrative reasons. That's a loaded term um, because the, the Bureau of Prisons and other prisons commonly call uh, solitary administrative segregation. Right. And it sounds really harmless, but in effect, it is solitary. Um, 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 and, and people are sent there for really minor reasons. And some reasons are for protective custody, like I mentioned in my testimony. So for example, with the LGBT community, which faces disproportionate harassment um, from other inmates in prisons, a lot of times they will be sent to involuntary protective custody to protect them from inmate violence, yet they're being punished. Um, 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 we see this happening all the time. In the Bureau of Prisons, for example, uh, according to, oh, you, you asked what was, does it actually work? So recently there was an independent review that was released to the public in February of this year by CNA that looked at uh, uh, solitary practices in our federal prisons. And it looked to this question, does inmate behavior change following solitary? And their response was absolutely no. I would just like to pause there. Can we have that report sure. put into the record for this hearing? Yeah, without objection. And then I want to just and also say that not only LGBT, uh, lesbian and gay uh, prisoners, but obviously transgender. Transgender, people. absolutely. But, but let me actually say what the CNA report actually found, because it's very important. It looked, like, it looked at a, a, an inmate's disciplinary record 12 months before being sent into solitary and 12 months after coming out of solitary. And it, fa and it found virtually no change whatsoever. So let's get to the, 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 the New York Times article you held up today, the consensus upon medical experts. What are, what is the damage, the trauma, the effect on an individual to be in solitary confinement? You said a shockingly, often on average of four years. Uh, I've talked to numerous inmates who've experienced that length or more. W what is the, the, the damage done to someone in general? Or, and, is, and would you also include in that someone who already has right. a mental health challenge? Well, first of all, when I think of this issue, and to use uh, you know, uh, an example that's contemporary, I think of it similar to climate change in the sense of there are certain people that just deny the science. Yet the scientific community, there's consensus. There's consensus about climate change, and there seems to be almost, there seems to be consensus also Please about Please don't lose this committee confinement. by talking about climate change. <laughs> Let's stick to the bipartisan consensus. But what, but what I mean is that there, there is consensus in the scientific community about the harms of solitary confinement. And there are really two kinds of harms. One is that it exacerbates pre-existing conditions. So me mental illness that existed before is exacerbated and becomes worse. And secondly, it also produces mental illness and also physical physical illness, um, things like anxiety, uh, depression, hypersensitivity to stimuli, um, bipolar disorder, there's ever been documentations of that. Um, you know, the list is long is, and, and long, and I'm happy to provide the committee with citations to every- I think that would be helpful Great. if you would provide more citations. We'll do that. I want to uh, switch. First of all, I just want to say uh, both to Mr. Dillard and Ms. Kerman, it's extraordinary that you are here with, with your testimony about what the experience of actual uh, people who've been behind bars, that's, that's extraordinary. Uh, and, and, and Ms. Kerman, I'd like to just, uh, in the little bit of time that I have left, just drill down on something that is often not talked about, but what's happening as a result of overcrowding. We saw this in Danbury when it was turned, uh, converted into a low, low security men's facility. You were close to your family 
And, and I'm really wondering what impact uh, does being in prison in close proximity to loved ones have on an inmate, and what impact would gender-specific programming have on uh, a woman's ability to successfully reenter? If you could, in the one minute I've left, just hit on both of those issues really briefly. Okay. Uh, proximity to f home, family, and community is overwhelmingly important for both men and women who are confined to prison or jail. The opportunity And let's to just be clear, the majority of women in prison have children, and the majority of imprisoned people, period, are the number one breadwinners for the family before they're incarcerated. Absolutely. The overwhelming number of women in prison are mothers, and most of those mothers are the mothers of minor children, kids under the age of 18, who experience sort of a seismic uh, impact when their mothers are incarcerated, because a lot of those moms are single moms who have primary responsibility for their kids. So... Uh, the opportunity to touch your children, to hold for your children to be reassured that their mother or their parent is okay uh, is incredibly important both to parent and child. The opportunity to see your own parents or family members, to maintain ties to the community broadly considered, to which you will almost inevitably return. Uh, Senator Johnson is absolutely correct. The vast majority of people who are coming, who are in prison, are coming home from prison. So those lifelines to the outside community are incredibly, can't, we can't overstate how important they are to public safety, to people's safe and successful return home to the community. Because when prison, when correctional systems, whether it's the BOP or otherwise, cut those lifelines by making visits very difficult, by placing people very, very far from their families, or by making prisons inaccessible in other ways, by making phone calls uh, exorbitantly expensive, or by, you know, many jails have no contact visits through glass, um, which is a huge disincentive to, to, uh, to have a visit. Um, those lifelines are cut, and the person who is incarcerated is much less likely to have both the family support, the safe and stable housing, the access to networks which might help them gain employment, all of which are primary concerns for successful reentry. And that is true whether you're talking about men or whether you're talking about women. When we are talking about female prisoners, just very quickly and briefly, we know that the three things that drive women's involvement in crime and their incarceration are substance abuse, mental illness, and again, that overwhelming experience of violence, either sexual violence or physical violence. 80% or more women and girls in the system report that happening to them before they were incarcerated. So the problem with incarceration, prisons and jails are very harsh places by design, is that for uh, prisoners who have experienced very significant trauma, like rape, childhood sexual abuse, domestic violence, many of the commonplace correctional practices are very reminiscent of some of those abuses. And so that creates a serious, serious challenge in terms of regular engagement with female prisoners, in terms of their rehabilitation, and in terms of their, again, ability to return home safely. I'm in deference to my colleagues. I'm over time, but thank you for that substantive answer. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Booker. And by the way, when Mr. Ofer uh, delved into climate change, he didn't lose the bipartisan <laughs> agreement. You know, we, I think we, we by and large agree there's been climate change, always has been, always will. Senator Heinkamp. And, and vaccines work, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they, they do. Yes, they, they do. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, at, at the risk of being embroiled in that side discussion. Um, you know, I was the Attorney General in North Dakota, um, spent a lot of time, actually, most of the drug task forces were under my jurisdiction, and we ran a lot of those. And it was at a time when um, there was a growing concern in 1992 with um, uh, the drug problem and with more and more violent crime. And as a result, um, we saw incarceration rates really skyrocket because of desperation. Um, and I will tell you this, it's been my experience that we constantly treat the symptoms but never treat the disease. And that's really where we are today, talking about how do we treat the symptoms and not how do we treat the disease. I'll tell you a story about a very wise man. I did a juvenile justice project and one where we made it a little tougher, a little easier to transfer kids into the adult system. But I traveled around the state of North Dakota with a prison warden by the name of Winston Satron. Um, he was a very wise guy, and, and at the time in North Dakota, you could actually interview 
every prisoner who came into the prison system. And he would sit down and he would say, tell me about your life. And as he talked, they'd say, my parents were divorced at 11 and I went to live with my grandma. And he'd write 11 in their, in their, pers in their prison file. Because in his opinion, that prisoner was 11 years old emotionally. And that, that's where we get stuck because a lot of this is related to trauma. A lot of this is related to not understanding trauma. And we exacerbate by not only not treating the trauma, but engaging in behaviors that further the trauma, whether it is isolation from family, whether it is isolation from any human contact at all. And so let's, let's be honest about the task that this society has imposed on the Bureau of Prisons. You know, we, you know, none of this should be any judgment on the Bureau of Prisons. We've given them an impossible task. They have to take, and, and prison crowding is part of that. They've got to maintain some level of security. And they're as desperate for uh, solutions as what they can be. But we're here talking about things that are way, way downstream. And we're not here talking about things that are upstream. And so um, the, the juvenile justice system is led really by a lot of very enlightened people at the Department of Justice has really begun a, a transformation into trauma-informed and trauma-based therapies. You know, looking at what can we do to treat trauma, how can we um, uh, basically prevent a lot of abuse, and a lot of abuse is, is self-medication. Uh, you know, a lot of addiction is, is I mean, it's chemical, I get it. I get that that's maybe the old model, but a lot of it is self-medicating for the trauma that's been experienced in people's lives. And so with all of that, I would like um, to, to know how we could design a system of prevention so that we don't see more people. What would you all, in your experience, like to see in communities that would uh, prevent the kinds of outcomes that we're seeing right now in the Bureau of Prisons. And we can start with you, Ms. Kerman. Uh, I think uh, it seems that there's a tremendous amount of recognition, thank you for the question, Senator Heitkamp, that uh, substance abuse and mental health problems, including full-blown mental illness, um, but also the everyday demons that many people suffer at some point in their lives, contribute to people's bad choices and, and breaking the law. And so a significant commitment to handle those health problems in the public health system as often as possible can, rather than the criminal justice system. Can I ask just system? quickly, of the women that mm -hmm. you um, worked with and, and, and were incarcerated with, how many of them were given a choice of um, drug court or some kind of intermediate kind of intervention? Yeah, that's very rare in the federal system. That's much more common in state systems or, uh, or county systems of justice. And so um, there's a program in New York called Justice Home where women who are facing at least a year of incarceration when their district attorney and their judge agree are able to enter this program called Justice Home. They stay at home, generally with their children, and are you know face a set of accountability measures but also get the mental health interventions or the substance abuse interventions, the parenting classes, the vocational training, whatever is specific to their case um, that is needed for them to get better outcomes. In New York, it costs about $60,000 a year to incarcerate somebody. That program costs about $17,000 a year. If we threw in the cost of foster care for you know, a family with two children, the cost would mount to $129,000 a year. Thank you. So yeah, that's I know. a great example. Mr. Diller. Thank you for your observation, Senator Health Um Trauma-informed care is truly something that's needed if we're going to be preventive. Um, all I, I can use myself uh, as an example of someone who had traumas at the age of 12, 13 years old who walked around with them for 35 years, never addressed, and I'm just burying them. Uh, when I was diagnosed, uh, you know, I had been severely depressed most of my life. Uh, one reason that um, I self-medicated with illegal drugs. Uh, had I been diagnosed, maybe I could have been given legal drugs and avoided the criminal justice system. Uh, the fact is, uh, we, we never looked at, look at the cause, we just look at the effect. And many, many, many of these young men and women who I encounter in the work that I do today uh, have tremendous traumas. And we're working as a, a peer organization to help them work through that. 
uh, to avoid uh, walking around as hurting people because we know that hurt people hurt people. Uh, and if we do not address those traumas early on, then further down the road after recidivism and recidivism and uh, we're still going to be paying a, a much higher cost. Thank you, Mr. Ofer. So I'm going to give a perspective informed by the fact that I spent a lot of my time in Newark, New Jersey, which is a terrific city. Um, and it is a city that is plagued by, by poverty. Um, and it's in, in, in certain communities, there's violence. And what I see in Newark, and really a lot of um, urban um, um, areas across New Jersey and even across the country, is that the only agency that's available in that municipality to address social needs, or, or at least the agency that's primarily available, is the police department. And to me, that is the root cause of the problem. You have well-meaning police officers, you have well-meaning city officials that literally have no one else to go to if there's, let's say, some minor misbehavior happening on the street that is minor, and that, but that should not be treated by the criminal justice system. And I'll, and I'll criticize also diversion programs. While they're certainly better than sending someone directly to jail or prison, my reaction is this person shouldn't have been entangled with the criminal justice system in the first place. They shouldn't have been arrested and then diverted to alternative programs. We need to build up the resources of municipalities, of states, to have other agencies to go to when they are um, uh, interacting with people with, 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 with mental illness or with drug addiction problems. And, and if I can just close with a comment, the stigmatization of that label is something you will carry the rest yeah. of your life. It will prevent you from getting student loans. It will prevent you to, from getting a job. And so it is, it is with a great deal of care that we should ever take that next step because we are, in fact, relegating that person to a certain quality of life for the rest of their life, especially given the age of the internet where we can find out anything about anyone. And so I, I, I just wanted to make a broader point that we're here to talk about what we're gonna do with high incarceration rates, but we cannot look at this problem without looking at the broad scope of services that are provided and how we can work more effectively for prevention. Thanks, Senator Heinkamp. Senator Ayotte. Uh, thank you. I want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, I think like my, my colleague, um, Senator Heitkamp, uh, we both were attorneys general in our state uh, before we came here to the Senate. And one of the things that um, I had worked on as an AG was uh, reentry programs. And I'm a strong supporter of the Second Chance Act and supporting its reauthorization, but saw it um, from an attorney general context where even people who were incarcerated um, for ser you know, serious crimes, uh, that we did not give them any path for success going forward because they came out, if they had a substance abuse problem, it was the underlying issue was never dealt with. If, they had, if there was mental health factors, that was not dealt with. No job, uh, no place to live. If you put yourself in those shoes and you're that person and you're put out on the street then, I dare say that all of us around this dais probably wouldn't be able to put it back together. So um, I wanted to get your thoughts. I, I, you know, Dr. Dillard, I saw that your focus is really, uh, as I understand what, what you're working on, it would be some form of reentry program. And we saw it in our state get um, some momentum and then sort of fizzle and wanted to get your thoughts on reentry type programs and what more we could do to make them more effective to try to to end this cycle um, and to get people on pr to productive lives. And then I have some other follow-up questions, but I appreciate Well, I think uh, reentry is, is a crucial point. Uh, if there's uh, planning done and uh, individuals are giving different options. Uh, I know the federal system, uh, six months in, in, in a halfway house is something that I went through that was very ben beneficial for me. I just wasn't released to the streets. And I was able to attain uh, employment during that period and save some money uh, to be able to rent a room at least when I uh, was done with my federal time. Uh, what I'm seeing today, though, uh, is young, young men coming out of our uh, state and, and county systems homeless. Uh, 17, 18 years old uh, who can't go live with their mother because 
Uh, they've been told you can't go there because of subsidies uh, uh, connected to their housing. And they're, they're couch sur surfing. And oftentimes when they're couch surfing, uh, it's probably with those who aren't doing so well or the antisocials uh, uh, that had an influence in them being placed in, in, in the criminal justice system uh, in the very first place. Um, housing initiatives are huge. Uh, I, I don't have the solutions. I can say that uh, we're working on them in, in the region that I'm working in. Um, nonprofits and faith-based organizations are engaging uh, with us in providing housing um, at an affordable rate. Um, you know, preparation uh, is, is huge. Individuals have to identify certain things while in custody in order to uh, have a paradigm shift that this can't be an option. This can't be an option. Uh, I had a client to tell me that, uh, you know, committing a new crime wasn't his first option, uh, uh, wasn't his first choice, but it was his very last option. And I knew, uh, know the troubling times that he was in, uh, sleeping on park benches, uh, couldn't go to the shelter be for various reasons, and uh, he committed a new crime. Um, as he told me, it wasn't his first choice, it was his very last option. Mm -hmm. And so the reentry process, along with all the barriers, I think mentoring, uh, uh, from formerly incarcerated or uh, connections with organizations that hire formerly incarcerated uh, because we are ambassadors. I look at us as being those who can help them through those trying times uh, of, uh, and pivot points of reentry. Senator, may I respond to that question very quickly? Sure. This is an oversight hearing on the Bureau of Prisons and the independent review that I keep referencing to, and I'm happy to submit my annotated copy we'll have a lot of highlighting, actually looked at this question of the Bureau of Prisons practices on reentry programming, and here's its finding in one sentence. There is no formal bureau-wide reentry preparedness program specific to restrictive housing and inmates in these settings, and inmates, and inmates in these settings have very lim limited access to reentry programming. The Bureau does not do a good job in reentry programming. About 2,000 people a year in the Federal Bureau of Prison go from solitary back to community. Mm -hmm. One of the things the study found is that many of them, they don't know the exact number because the Bureau doesn't track it, are sent directly from solitary back to communities. That is a terrible practice that needs to stop immediately. There needs to be a focus on reentry programming in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. Thank you. Um, and uh, Ms. Kerman, I wanted to ask you, um, one of the things that we're seeing, uh, and I saw this when I was AG as well, but we're seeing just on a devastating scale in our state right now is um, opioid and heroin addiction. And um, I've been working on legislation called the Compre Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. I'm hoping that we're going to take this issue up here to not only the, um, I hope, the Second Chance Act, but also this Comprehensive Addiction Recovery Act. There was some discussion you had about um, this idea of alternative courts up front. Um, what, do you, what would you do as you think about uh, this issue? How many people did you encounter that, that had addiction issues that were underlying uh, why they were in prison? And how, how do you see I, this to me, uh, to Senator Heitkamp's point, I fully agree. We can't arrest our way out of this. This is a public health crisis. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to get your thoughts on what, what you think we should be focusing yeah. on most. Thank you, Senator. Um, what's happening in New Hampshire is also happening in Ohio and you know all over this country in terms of huge spikes in, in deaths from, from heroin and other It's devastating. Opiates. I mean, you wouldn't believe the parents that are coming to me. It's just heartbreaking. Yeah, it is. It's devastating. Um, it is fundamentally um, a public health question first and foremost, and so its intersections with the criminal justice system really should be secondary, um, particularly as we continue to see crime rates very low, uh, violent crime rates very low. And so while obviously people who sell or use drugs are breaking the law, um, remembering that uh, intervening in that addiction cycle is the single most important thing and can't be accomplished with a prisoner or a jail cell um, is completely central. 
Um, we see a lot of people, a lot of folks in the states trying lots of different things. And I'm obviously not a, not, neither a doctor nor an expert in addiction, but we see safe harbors in places like, I believe, Gloucester, Massachusetts, and some other parts of the New England states have really tried very innovative approaches to pr getting folks the medical help they need and having that be the primary concern rather than incarceration. When we look at states like New York, New Jersey, California, the states that have reduced their prison populations the most and also have simultaneously continued to enjoy huge declines in violent crime. One of the things that we've seen in those states, and I know Rudy could weigh in on New Jersey, is a huge decline in prosecutions and incarceration of people for low-level drug offenses and a recognition that those um, that public disorder um, is a reflection of a health problem, and that's the, that's the way to tackle it. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Ayotte. Senator Baldwin. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank our panelists. What a tremendous opportunity it is for us to hear from you and, and interact with you. And Mr. Chairman, I really want to join the thanks of holding this hearing, um, I, also to the ranking member. Uh, as, as you said in the outset, and many have commented, this is a very big and very complex issue. And so I hope we'll have additional opportunities. And I'm, I want to say that I'm glad that you're recognizing this committee's role in that discussion, and I hope that we can t keep that up. Um, there's a number of things I, I wanted to touch on. I heard the ranking member talking about um, upholding the um, models and states that are working. And um, I, I usually love to brag about my state, but in this particular case, I am just going to share some of the statistics about racial disparities in the incarcerated population in our state. In Wisconsin, um, African Americans constitute only 6% of the state population, a little bit more. 35% um, of those incarcerated in state prisons are African American. According to a recent study from the University of uh, Wisconsin in Milwaukee, 13% of Wisconsin's African American men of working age were behind bars, which is almost double the national average of 6.7%. And the figures were particularly shocking and dismal for Milwaukee County, where more than 50% of African American men in their 30s had served time in prison. 45% um, uh, of the inmates at our federal correctional facility, Oxford, are African American, and 19.3 are Hispanic. And I hope as we continue to work on this very complex issue that that will be um, on our minds. I also just wanted to, to mention, it, uh, you know, I previously, people are talking about their previous service, uh, attorney generals, et cetera. I was never attorney general. I practiced law in a small uh, general practice firm at the very beginning of my uh, 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 career. Uh, mostly general practice. A couple of times I took uh, misdemeanor public defender cases. That's really my only immediate interaction. But I was becoming involved in county politics and state level uh, uh, legislative office at this time where I felt like I saw the precursors of what we're seeing now being debated. So um, I had the honor, actually, of serving as chairwoman of the Corrections Committee in the, state of, in the state legislature for one term. I actually took our committee to prisons for tours, for visits, for conversations with people who worked there, people who were inmates there. We had sometimes legislative hearings in the prisons. We went to the intake facility, the maximum, one of the maximum security prisons, one of the medium security prisons for men, one of the minimum security prisons for men. We went to the women's prison on a couple of occasions and visited work release facilities. At the same time, the legislature was talking about should we um, allow private prisons to be built and run in Wisconsin? Should we contract with other states to deal with our overflow issues? Um, and have them house our Wisconsin prisoners. Um, and the counties were doing the same thing because some of the uh, jails at the county level were 
uh, overflowing. And the debate, the substantive criminal justice debate in our state at the time, this is the early 90s, three strikes, you're out, elimination of probation, parole. We were creating new felonies. We had A felony and a B felony. We created an AB felony. Um, the new crimes were being created. Um, and there was a lot of debate about the elimination of prison-based vocational programs. Mandatory minimums were, were a big topic. You could, you could see all of this sort of in, in the future. And, and now the future has come. And it is not going to be overnight that we figure out what missteps we had and how we um, deal with this in a, in a, in a saner way. Um, I have a couple of questions, um, and if I don't get to all of them, I'm hoping that you will be willing to submit some uh, answers in writing for some things we might not get to. Um, quickly, uh, I, um, Ms. Kerman, you uh, mentioned that women are the fastest growing prison population right now. I remember years ago when I was visiting the women's prison in, in Wisconsin, um, it seemed that to me there were gender differences in how they dealt with certain issues. We've talked a lot about solitary confinement. Is there a gender difference in how um, these issues are dealt with in women's prisons? For example, I remember being very concerned about over-medication of women in um, the women's prison to deal with behavioral issues as opposed to placement in solitary confinement. Is this something we should still be looking at? Uh, we should absolutely be looking at the use of solitary confinement um, in men's and women's prisons. Um, I echo Udi's testimony that solitary confinement is often used not for the most serious infractions, like an assault, for example, but rather for very low-level infractions. Women are overwhelmingly likely to be incarcerated for a nonviolent crime and are very unlikely to use violence while they are incarcerated. Women's facilities do not tend to be to struggle with violence as one of their guiding issues in terms of security. Um, solitary confinement is overwhelmingly used as a punitive measure. Female prisoners are disproportionately likely to suffer from mental illness. Their mental illness in men's facilities is a huge problem. It's an even bigger problem in women's facilities. Um, one of the tragic things about solitary confinement is that mentally ill people have a more difficult time following the rules of a prison. And so what you see is spiraling sanctions which ultimately land them in solitary confinement, a place profoundly inappropriate for anybody with mental illness. A regularly healthy person who's placed in solitary confinement for 10 days, after 10 days will start to significantly deteriorate mentally, emotionally, psycholo psychologically, uh, let alone a mentally ill person placed in those circumstances. Since I only have a couple of seconds left, let me ask a quick uh, question about um, reentry and uh, both in prison and after prison access to vocational and educational programming. And you can certainly feel free to um, elaborate uh, after the fact in writing because I know I have such limited time. But again, I recall the restriction of uh, any sort of public funds or um, individualized financial aid assistance to those, particularly in state prison, because that was um, something I was looking at um, closely. Um, I believe that's continued over time, and we have additional restrictions. Um, once a person is back in the community, they want to seek additional vocational or higher education generally. Um, it makes it impossible for uh, the financial aid. You've talked already, Mr. Dillard, about people emerging burdened with debt not related to higher education. Tell me a little bit about the options for people to secure post-high school education upon release. Well, I'm seeing more uh, opportunities opening up for individuals uh, post-release. Um, at one time, there was you check a box and, and you can get uh, student loans. I'm happy to hear that the Pell Grants, there's a pilot going on uh, within the federal system with Pell Grants. Uh, I am so happy to hear that because it's a fact that uh, individuals prior to 1994, I know many individuals who served time prior to that who came out with associate's degrees and went on to achieve bachelor's and master's. Uh, the fact is 98% uh, of those who get a higher 
a, a bachelor's or a higher degree never return to prison. I mean, we, that's something that we can't ignore. And I think that we should support um, as far as uh, higher education within the system. Thanks, Senator Baldwin. Uh, we do have a second panel. I mean, we could keep going on. And this, this has been fascinating. Uh, again, I want to thank this panel. Uh, as we talked beforehand, that the purpose of every hearing, from my standpoint, in this committee is to define the problem, lay out the reality, so we collectively commit we have it. I think you've accomplished that goal uh, big time. Mr. Chairman, if, yes. I, if I may, it is such a complex issue. We've dealt with such distinct verticals here from solitary confinement to the lack of reentry programs. It might be good to pick one of those verticals given the vastness of this problem and maybe hold another hearing where we can invite no, them. I was just going to get there. We, we, this, is, this is just a first, and I think what will end up being a series of hearings. Uh, you know, we actually have a mission statement for this committee, a little unusual for a Senate committee. It's, it's pretty simple, to enhance the economic and national security of America. I think this issue touches both. Um, one of the things we've tried to do this committee, too, is find the areas of agreement. I think what you've seen in this hearing is there's a great deal of bipartisan agreement that what we're doing just isn't working, and not because of lack of effort by our, our, our next panel of witnesses, by any stretch of the imagination. So, Mr. Ofer, I would encourage you and your organization to continue to press for this and work with those of us that want to solve this problem. I think your, your points on solitary confinement are, are dead on, and, and we need to fix that. Mr. Dillard, you know, God bless you for having turned your life around and taking your circumstance and offering that to, to your, your fellow, fellow man to, to help other people find uh, redemption and, and uh, again, turn their lives around as well. As, and uh, Ms. Kerman, I think you're with your unintended celebrity, I think you've done an, an excellent job of raising these issues. You know, I've already spoken to my staff. You know, I liked your answer to the question in terms of what are alternatives? And from my standpoint, uh, a rigorous you know, uh, dose of community uh, reparation and uh, those types of programs, community service, I think is probably the appropriate for, for people that have committed crimes. Uh, we do need some punishment, we need deterrence, but hopefully in those community service, you, you just might, you know, you might heal and you just might find that a far more effective way at dealing with these issues than locking somebody up and, you know, re really, Seeing, seeing the result that's simply not working. So again, I just want to thank everybody here on, on, on this panel. I uh, want to continue to work with you on, and work with the members of the committee on a bipartisan basis. And no, this is, this is just a first of what will be, I'm sure, a, a series of, uh, I think, very important hearings. So thank you very much. We'll call up our next panel. By the way, if you have time, I'd love to have you stay and listen to uh, our next panel as well. But you don't have to feel obligated to. Mr. Samuels is going to sit down. I'm going to ask you to stand right away again because it is the tradition of this committee to swear in witnesses. So if you'll both rise and raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you'll give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Please be seated. Our first witness in this panel will be Mr. Charles E. Samuels, Jr. Mr. Samuels is the director of the Federal Bureau of Prisons and was appointed on December 21, 2011. He is a career public administrator in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, previously serving as the assistant director of the Correctional Programs Division, where he oversaw all inmate management and program functions. Director Samuels was also responsible for enhancing the agency's reentry initiatives. Mr. Samuels. Good morning, Chairman Johnson, ranking member Carper and members of the committee, I thank you for your time and focus on the important issue of federal corrections. 
I'm pleased to discuss with you today the operations of the Federal Bureau of Prisons. I'm also pleased to speak on behalf of our 39,000 dedicated correctional workers across the country who are on the job 24 hours a day, seven days a week to support the Bureau's public safety mission. We protect society by confining offenders in facilities that are safe, humane, cost efficient, and appropriately secure. And we provide offenders programs to help them become law-abiding citizens. Simply stated, we protect society and reduce crime. But we face significant challenges. The Bureau does not control the number of offenders who enter our system or the length of their stay. We are required to house all federal offenders sentenced to prison while maintaining safety, security, and effective reentry programs. We house offenders convicted of a variety of offenses, many serving long sentences and many with extensive histories of violence. Drug offenders make up almost half of our population. In addition, we house many individuals convicted of weapons, sex, and immigration offenses, to include individuals convicted of international and domestic terrorism. The Bureau is the largest correctional agency in the country, with more than 207,500 offenders in 122 federal prisons, 13 private prisons, and 178 community-based facilities. Our agency began to expand rapidly in the 1980s, due largely to the nation's war on drugs. From 1980 to the present, we experienced an eight-fold increase in the size of our inmate population. Crowding in federal prisons reached nearly 40% system-wide, and even higher at medium and high security prisons, where the more violence-prone offenders reside. The tremendous growth in the inmate population outpaced staffing resources and negatively impacted institution safety. Our ability to effectively supervise prisoners and provide inmate programs depends on having sufficient numbers of staff available at our prisons. Recently, population pressures abated slightly. In fiscal year 2014, we saw the first decline in the inmate population in more than 34 years. And we project declines to continue for the next couple of years, but crowding will remain a challenge. Staff safety, as well as the safety of the public and the offenders we house is my highest priority. Every day our staff put the safety of the American people above their own to keep communities safe and secure. Some of the saddest days in my 27 year career occurred one week in 2013 when two staff were killed in the line of duty. Correctional officer Eric Williams was killed on February 25th and the next day Lieutenant Osvaldo Abrati was murdered. These tragedies are powerful reminders of the real dangers our staff face. To enhance safety, the Bureau has taken advantage of technologies for contraband detection and perimeter security. We're piloting pepper spray for staff, and we are requiring the use of protective vests. We increased our correctional officer staffing at high security institutions during evenings, weekends, and holidays. Over the past few years, we have been proactive in addressing concerns regarding the use of restrictive housing. Since 2012, we substantially reduced the number of inmates in our special housing units and special management units. Less than 7% of our population is in restrictive housing, and very few inmates are housed without another individual in the cell. Our focus is to ensure inmates are placed in restrictive housing for the right reasons and for the right amount of time. We created new secure mental health units for inmates who need specialized treatment, as well as a high degree of supervision to protect themselves and others. We look forward to making additional reforms in the area of restrictive housing. We have a saying in the Bureau that reentry begins on the first day of incarceration. This means that we assess each offender by reviewing issues related to criminal behavior, including substance abuse, education, and mental health. We offer numerous programs to target offender needs and prepare them to transition successfully to their communities. Many of our programs have been proven to reduce recidivism, such as the Residential Drug Abuse Treatment Program, Federal Prison Industries, and Vocational and Educational Programs. We have programs for mentally ill offenders, including those with histories of trauma. We also have programs for offenders with cognitive impairments, sex offense histories, and those with severe personality disorders. We provide programs to help offenders deepen their spiritual faith, and we have programs specifically tailored to the needs of female offenders. The Bureau relies on a network of community-based facilities, residential reentry centers or halfway houses, as well as home confinement. 
Community placements help offenders readapt to the community and secure housing, jobs, medical care, and more. Chairman Johnson, Ranking Member Carper, and members of the committee, this concludes my formal statement. I'm proud of the work our staff do to keep Americans safe. Again, I thank you for your time and focus on the important issue of federal corrections. Thank you, Director Samuels. Our next witness is Michael Horowitz. Mr. Horowitz is the Inspector General for the Department of Justice. During his tenure as the Inspector General, the Office of Inspector General has identified a number of areas for possible reform within the Bureau of Prisons, including its budget, inmate programming, especially as it relates to the elderly inmate population, increasing safety and security risk for inmates, and implementation and management of the Compassionate Release Program. Mr. Horowitz. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Carper, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. The Justice Department faces two interrelated crises in managing the pre federal prison system. Prison costs continue to rise, while federal prisons remain significantly overcrowded. In an era of tight budgets, this path is unsustainable. Since fiscal year 2000, the Bureau of Prisons budget has nearly doubled and now accounts for 25% of the department's discretionary budget. The BOP has more employees than any other DOJ component and the second largest budget at the DOJ, trailing only the FBI. One of the primary drivers of these cost increase, uh, increases, in addition to the increased prison population, is health care which cost the BOP over $1 billion in 2014, a 61% increase since 2006. This rapid increase can partly be attributed to the aging of the federal inmate population. In a recent OIG report, we found the number of inmates aged 55 and 50 and older increased by 25% from 2009 to 2013. By contrast, the population of inmates under age 50, 50 actually decreased by 1% including a decrease of 29% for inmates under age 30. This demographic shift is notable because aging inmates cost more to incarcerate. Our report also found that BOP institutions lack appropriate staffing levels to address the needs of the aging inmate population. For example, while social workers are uniquely qualified to assist aging inmates, the BOP employs only 36 social workers nationwide. We further found that the physical infrastructure of BOP institutions cannot adequately house aging inmates and that the BOP has not conducted a nationwide review of the accessibility of its institutions since 1996. Additionally, we found the BOP does not provide programming opportunities specifically addressing the needs of aging inmates. We also concluded that based on their lower rates of recidivism, certain aging inmates could be viable candidates for early release, a program that Congress has authorized. However, we found that in just over one year following the Attorney General's announcement of an elderly compassionate release program, the Department and the BOP had only released two elderly inmates pursuant to it. These findings are similar to what we reported in our 2013 review of the BOP's compassionate release program for all inmates. We found that BOP's program had been poorly managed and was implemented inconsistently. Following our review, the BOP expanded its compassionate release program and has modestly, modestly increase the number of inmates released under it. In our 2011 review of the Department's International Prisoner Transfer Program, another program Congress has authorized and which permits foreign national inmates to serve the remainder of their sentences in their home countries, the OIG found that the Department rejected 97% of transfer requests and transferred less than 1% of inmates to their home countries to complete their sentence. We concluded the Department needed to make a number of improvements to the program including ensuring it accurately determined whether inmates are eligible for the program. And we're currently completing a follow-up review to that report. Another area where the BOP costs have increased substantially is for private contract prisons, which are largely used to house inmates, many of the BOP's uh, 40,000 non-US national inmates. The BOP's budget for contract facilities is over $1 billion, and the proportion of federal inmates housed in BOP contract prisons has increased from 2% in 1980 to about 20% in 2013. Indeed, two of the three largest DOJ contractors are private prison providers. In addition to addressing rising costs, the department must also address, continue to address efforts to ensure the safety and security of staff and inmates. Prison overcrowding represents the most significant threat to the safety and security of BOP staff and inmates with federal prisons at 30% overrated capacity. 
Indeed, in every one of its agency financial reports since 2006, the department has identified prison overcrowding as a programmatic material weakness, yet the problem remains unresolved today. In addition to overcrowding, the unlawful introduction of contraband presents a serious threat to safety and security. The unauthorized use of cell phones has proven to be a particularly significant risk, and the GAO has reported that the number of cell phones confiscated by the POP more than doubled from 2008 to 2010. Additionally, sexual abuse in prison remains a serious safety and security issue. The OIG has continued its longstanding efforts to investigate sexual abuse by institution staff at federal prisons and detention facilities. In addition, we recently reported on the department's efforts to implement and comply with the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Finally, a significant management challenge for the department has been measuring the success of its prison programs. An essential building block to achieving performance-based management is having reliable data, an issue that has proven to be a challenge for both the department and the BOP. A comprehensive approach to the collection analysis and analysis of data on how well BOP programs are reducing incarceration rates, deterring crime, and improving public safety will help the department focus its resources and make strategic investments. Thank you for the committee's uh, continued support for our work, and I'd be happy to answer any questions the committee may have. Thank you, Inspector General Horowitz. Uh, Mr. Sam, or Director Samuels, let me start with you. First of all, I do not envy your task, and, and I really do want to thank you for your service, uh, which has been longstanding. So let me start there. You know, according to your, your bio that I have in front of me, you, you began, began as a correctional officer in March of 1988. Uh, can you just, because we've all quoted statistics here, that in 1980 the prison population in the federal system was 25,000, now it's over 200,000. Can you just give us your perspective in terms of what all's happened, what you've witnessed uh, over your career? Thank you, Senator. From, from my perspective, having joined the agency as a correctional officer in 1988, and around that time the Bureau's population was a little more than 60,000. I think historically when you look at the Bureau of Prisons and you go back to 1940 and from 1940 to 1980, the Bureau's population pretty much remained flat for many, many years in excess of 20,000. So in 1980, which is the primary target you know, for this discussion, we, as an agency, we had approximately 24,000 inmates in the federal system. We had less than 9,000 employees, 41 institutions, and we were able to operate the entire Bureau of Prisons for $330 million. So when you look at the increase from 1980 to 2013, we were at more than 800% as far as the growth of the population. And our staffing didn't keep pace with that growth. And with our mission, where we're tasked with anyone and everyone who is convicted and turned over to the Department of Justice and placed in the care of the Bureau of Prisons, we have a job to do, a significant job. And it takes staff to do the work you know, that is required. Okay, l l let, me, let me ask you, from your perspective, again, you've been there. What drove that dramatic increase in prison population? Well, the war on drugs in the early 80s had a significant drive on the, the growth of the population. And as a result, we were having more offenders come into uh, the system. And we have a longstanding practice within the Bureau of Prisons, and this goes all the way back into the 1930s, that our reentry efforts are always in play. And that is for, to ensure for our role that we're providing rehabilitation. But the challenges associated with what we have to do is we're trying to protect the inmates as well as the staff who are in our facilities. But the driver has been the war on drugs. Has there been any legitimate increase due to a crackdown on violent crime that uh, you know, we, just, we just really, again, appropriately cracked down on that? Or is that really like we didn't become a more criminal society? We are, we are we're always arresting those people, convicting and putting them in jail. Are we putting them there longer? I mean, I, I want you to address that potential yes, the, aspect of this as well. In, in regards to violent offenses, the department, through prosecutorial efforts, there is a mixture of individuals, as you all are aware, nonviolent criminals and those with violence. And within our population, I think it's very safe to say that we have very violent offenders 
in our population to include a significant amount of gang members. In the federal system, we have more than 21,000 security threat group members who pose a significant threat to the public, inmates, and staff. So, so it, again, if we're talking about gang violence, would that also be, you know, again, generally driven by drugs? It can be driven by drugs if the, the gangs and those who are associated with that activity, if it's part of the structure within the gangs for monetary gain. Okay. Let, let me, uh, again, stick with the Director Samuels here and just ask some of the questions uh, uh, in terms of uh, Inspector General Horowitz's testimony. Why haven't we been more proactive in terms of some of these early release programs that have been authorized? I mean, is, is there a risk aversion there? Because, I mean, who, who wants to be responsible for releasing somebody into the public that is going to commit another violent crime? Can you just kind of speak to, to why we haven't uh, taken advantage of those programs a little bit more uh, robustly? Yes, in the, the Bureau of Prisons, as director of the agency, my authority is very limited when you look at taking advantage of the various programs that are being you no know, reference. With compassionate release, which I will start there, we as an agency did a thorough review and we determined a couple of years ago when we were looking at the number of individuals who would meet the criteria just for the release based on a terminal illness, we discovered that there were a little more than 200 inmates in the Bureau of Prisons. And once they were identified, you have to go further in making sure that for those individuals who are even being considered, that they have the resources if they are in fact given the opportunity through a motion and are released under that program. So 200 inmates agency-wide with the population at that time that was at 220,000 is a very, very small number. So again, we're talking about compassionate release, we're talking about early release, we're talking about uh, release to foreign nationals, and under all three of those types of programs, are you saying that the law or the regulation is, is just written too restrictively and just doesn't give you the, the latitude to, to utilize those programs more, more fully? And then, I'll, Inspector General, I'll be asking you the same question. Well, we've expanded, as you know, with the compassionate release program, we moved from medical to non-medical. And, and even when we look at those cases, and many are you know, being referred, when you're looking at the criteria as well as being responsible for public safety for any of those individuals having the propensity to continue more criminal activity, we have to take that into account. With the treaty transfer program, and, and I do share the concerns that the Inspector General has raised, we identified through the audit a problem there, and we have since that time provided a number of training you know, opportunities for our staff, as well as educating the inmate population on their rights under consideration for the program, and we have seen an increase. However, when we submit the applications for consideration, there is another process that takes place with the department working with the various countries who have agreements under the treaty transfer program to make determinations on when those individuals are removed. And of course, they'd probably rather have the U.S. bear the cost of keeping those people in prison themselves. Uh, Inspector General Horowitz, can you just kind of, again, speak to why, from your perspective, why some of these programs have been utilized uh, more fully? Um, I, I think there are a couple of reasons, and I would agree with Director Samuels. In many of them, it's not because of the BOP decision making. It's elsewhere in the department or the way the programs have been structured and the narrow, uh, the restrictions that have been placed on their use. For example, elderly release, age 65 and over, uh, is where the threshold was set. The Attorney General announced that with great fanfare in August 2013, the increase in that use of that program, yet there's only two we find inmates being released under that program a year plus later. Why is that? Well, in part, it's because of the 4,000 plus inmates who are over age 65 in the federal prison system. They have to meet certain very strict criteria, and both with regard to meeting the criteria and as we found in that program and treaty transfer, um, the discretionary calls that have to be made. Um, and perhaps it's risk aversion, uh, perhaps it's a feeling that someone got a jail sentence, they should... L let me ask, sentence. appropriately strict criteria? Um, we found, we had concerns with the elderly uh, provisions. For example, requiring people to serve a long period of time at, and to demonstrate a lengthy period of service of a sentence. What that meant was, for inmates who were the least dangerous, presumably had low sentences, they couldn't get released because they hadn't served a long 
period of time. That seemed odd to us. So, 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 we, so that's something we should really take a look at. Right. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I don't want to go over too much over time. Uh, Senator Ayotte. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Director Samuels, I actually want to ask you um, about uh, a particular prison in my state that's important, um, especially it's in Coas County. It's FCI Berlin. And I wanted to ask about what the status is of staffing uh, at that facility. Uh, Warden Tatum has indicated that the facility was staffed at about 290 and that there were about 1,200 incarcerated individuals there. Can you give me an update on levels and also what the ultimate goal is for capacity there and staffing? Yes, thank you, Senator. Right now with the plan for continued activation of the facility, we are working very, very closely with the, the warden staff there to ensure that our recruitment efforts remain on target. And we're also ensuring that as we build a population that we're making sure that the inmate to staff ratio is where it needs to be so we don't have more inmates in the facility until we're very comfortable with the number of staff that we have at the facility. And this is continuing to progress. I know there was a concern at one period of time where the applicant pool was not necessarily where we would like it, but with the recruitment efforts, we're starting to see that we have a very good pool for hiring individuals to work at the facility. So one follow-up I wanted on the applicant pool. Um, this is an area of our state where people are always looking um, for more jobs. And so to get people from the area that have strong backgrounds, one of the issues that's been a challenge is the 37-year-old age restriction. And has the Bureau of Prison actually re-examine this. I know I've previously written the Bureau of Prison on this issue, but it's important that my constituents have an opportunity that live in the area to work there. Yes, thank you again, Senator. Our, our focus is to make sure that we are aggressively hiring from the local community, as well as looking at veterans. And we do have the ability for individuals who are applying, who've served, to make waiver, to grant waivers, and we are in the process of doing that. Well, that's very good to know, and I appreciate your prioritizing hiring people from the community. I know they're anxious um, and would like opportunities to work there, as well as our veterans, so I really appreciate your doing that. And um, I think you'll find that they're a really dedicated group of people in the area, so th thank you for that. I wanted to um, follow up on the prior panel. There was quite a bit of uh, discussion and and criticism, actually, on the reentry program piece uh, from the Bureau of Prison and the commitment toward uh, where we are when someone is finished their time and putting forward successful programs and path to success, uh, which I'm interested because, you know, with our recidivism rate, it costs us a lot financially and also to the individual uh, to the quality of life uh, that the person has an opportunity to set a new start if there's not a good system in place for success. So I wanted to get your comments on what you heard in the prior panel on this issue. Well, thank you again, Senator. And I, again, will say to everyone that reentry is one of the most important parts of our mission, along with safety and security of our facilities. And the expectation bureau-wide is for all staff all the men and women who work in the Bureau of Prisons to have an active role in our reentry efforts. On any given day in the Bureau of Prisons for education, we have more than 52,000 inmates who are participating in education. We have more than 12,000 individuals actively participating in our Federal Prisons Industries Program, which is our largest recidivism program in the Bureau of Prisons. Those who participate are 24% less likely to be involved in coming back to, to prison. And for vocational training, more than 10,000 inmates are participating. And for those individuals who participate compared to those who are not, the recidivism reduction is 33%. You know, percent. And you all are very familiar with our residential drug abuse program, and we also have our non-residential programs as well. And we are very, very adamant in ensuring that these programs are provided to all inmates within our population to have them involved for a number of reasons. It's safer to manage prisons when inmates are actively involved. 
And we are definitely trying to do our part to ensure that for recidivism reduction in this nation that we are taking the lead. For the number of individuals who come into the Bureau of Prisons despite all the challenges and the, the figures that you're hearing, the men and women in the Bureau of Prisons do an amazing job. When you look at the specific numbers relative to recidivism for the federal system, when individuals relieve, we have 80% who do not return to the federal system, 80%. Now we have that 20% who eventually end up in state and or local, and we have always known that the overall recidivism for the federal system is 40%, those 20% that return to the Bureau and the 20% that go into the state systems. And I would just also add that when you look at the, the Bureau of Prisons, and there's a study that has been done that for the state correctional systems, and it's 30 plus, when you look at the overall average for recidivism is 67%. So I would still say that we have a lot of work to do. I mean, the goal is to have 100% individuals never returning. But as I've already stated for the record, the amount of growth that has occurred over that time period, we are very limited with our staffing, but it does not remove us from the commitment to our mission. If our staffing had kept pace with the growth over the years, I do believe that I would be sitting here reporting that the 80% would have been much higher. So I want to give uh, the Inspector General an opportunity to comment on how you think we're doing on reentry and uh, any work that you've done on that. We're actually centered in the middle of a review of the reentry programs and the use of reentry, and we're in the middle of field work going to the institutions to look at those programs, look at the education programs because of the concerns we'd heard. So I can't give you a report yet out on it. I, I think we will have something later in the year for you to look at, but it is a very significant concern. One of the issues, I'll just pick up on what Director Samuel said about staffing. That's a significant issue. That's a significant safety issue, security issue, reentry, because what you see is, first of all, by most accounts, the federal staffing ratio of inmate to staff is worse than many of the state systems, uh, what they have. And that's been exacerbated over time as the prison population has grown. There's a cascading effect of that. The director and the staff have to pull people out of other programs to do correctional work mm -hmm. um, that they can't be doing some of the other programs we're all talking about. And so that, I think, is lost sometimes as, and something certainly we're looking at right now is that cascading effect. If you understaff the prisons, the director has to first and foremost make sure that the prisons are safe. I hope when you uh, issue this report that you'll also give us guidance on what the models are. What are the best models for reentry? If we're going to invest more resources in this to create a better path for success for people so that they don't um, so we can reduce the recidivism rate, I think your recommendations on the piece of what's working best where we should invest resources would be really helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Senator. Yeah, while, while we're quick on this subject, uh, I was handed a note that apparently only 10,000 out of the 210,000 uh, population are participating in that reentry program. Can you just quick describe why, both of you? I mean, it, it, it's a, it sounds like a very successful program. I mean, wh why aren't more people engaged in it? Because I, I think in total we release about 45,000, I think, from the briefing, about 45,000 prisoners every year. Yes, if, if the 10,000 is in reference to the vocational training you know, programs, we only have a limited number of opportunities that we can provide based on the number of inmates in our system. And that goes back to the crowding. With increased crowding, you have waiting lists in the federal prison system, no different than any other system. And the goal is to try to push as many of these inmates through, and as we complete classes, we bring more you know, individuals in for participation. It's what I expect is an answer. I want to get that on the record, uh, Inspector General. Yes, I, I think that's generally what we're finding is, is there are limited resources. With limited resources mean limited number of classes. Okay. Senator Booker. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Director Samuels, I really appreciate you being here, but more importantly, uh, or, or excuse me, also I appreciate the fact that you uh, visited me in my office and uh, take a lot of the issues and concerns. You represent an administration as a whole. Uh, as the president has, have done uh, some extraordinary steps around overall criminal justice reform, and I'm, I'm grateful that you're here today. It means a lot. 
Uh, I also want to just echo, uh, you are a part of the law enforcement community, and uh, your officers uh, put themselves at risk every single day uh, to protect uh, this nation. And, and I'm grateful for the sacrifices that your officers made. I'm glad you mentioned, as we see on the federal and state level, uh, we do have officers not just losing their lives in the line of duty, but also officers who are injured uh, pretty severely or, or often in the line of duty as well. And we as Americans should recognize that and that sacrifice and commitment. <laughs> Um, I, I want to talk to you really uh, quick and, and focus my questions in on solitary confinement and begin with solitary confinement of juveniles. Um, there's a bipartisan dialogue going on right now about uh, putting uh, real limitations on the use of solitary confinement. Now, we know that there's, this is an issue that faces thousands and thousands of uh, uh, children across America, but when it comes to the federal system, this is actually a very small amount. It was probably surprised a lot of people that were just talking about uh, kids in, the, in a matter of dozens. And so uh, it, this is in two populations, really. It's children that are tried as adults, uh, that are uh, housed in uh, adult facilities, and then the contracts, uh, if I'm correct, that you, that you do with state facilities um, for, for juveniles as well. Um, do you think it's feasible that, uh, as is being discussed in Congress right now, and I can, I, I've been in a lot of the discussions in the Senate, that we just eliminate uh, solitary confinement uh, or severely limit it uh, for children, uh, being very specific, for instance, by placing a three-hour time limit on uh, juvenile solitary confinement and banning it, really, for punitive or administrative purposes? Is that something that you would see as feasible and, and something that you would be supportive of? Thank you. Senator, and I believe that for this issue, and in the federal system, as you've already mentioned, we contract out this service. We do not have any juveniles in an adult correctional facility. And the expectation that we have with the service providers for us is that at any time they're considering placing a juvenile in restrictive housing, they are required to notify us immediately. And, and even if that placement were to take place there is a requirement also that they have to monitor those individuals every 15 minutes. So in regards to your question with looking at the restrictions that could be considered, I would say that for our purposes regarding this, that it would be something that is definitely something that should be considered and looked at as a practice. And, and so if, if Congress were to act uh, on, on legislation, uh, putting those uh, severe limitations on the practice, uh, with limitations uh, of just a matter of hours, uh, that's something you, that you would greet as something that is feasible? Yes. I, I really appreciate that, and, and that's actually encouraging uh, to the discussions going on uh, right now. Um, and, and frankly, it's small population, but doing it on the federal level would send a signal to uh, really resonate throughout our country and, frankly, would is already being done in, in some jurisdictions. Uh, a pivoting to adult uh, solitary confinement, if I may, um, this practice, as you know, has been harshly criticized. If you were listening to the other panel, uh, there's a lot of data uh, from the medical community uh, uh, specifically, and also the civil rights community and human rights communities. Uh, a, a May 2013 report, which I know you're also familiar with from the GAO, found that the Federal Bureau of Prisons uh, didn't know whether its use of solitary confinement had any impact on prison safety. Uh, didn't know necessarily how it affected the individuals who endure the practice or how much, frankly, it's costing taxpayers in general. Uh, just this year, an, a recent internal audit by the Bureau of Prisons noted inadequacies in mental health care and reentry preparedness for people in solitary confinement. As uh, uh, was said in the previous panel, many people max out in solitary and then find themselves going right into the general, I shouldn't say general population, right going back into the public. Um, in many ways, I think these are reports are kind of a wake-up call of the, of the seriousness of this issue. And so I, I first want to just say, do, do you know right now uh, how many people are in solitary confinement beyond 12 months or, say, 24 months or 36 months? Do you, do you, do you have that data? Senator, I can provide that data for you. Okay. So we do track uh, those folks who are staying in often for years in solitary. Yes, and, and Senator Booker, I, I can... First, I'd, I'd like just to state for the, the Bureau of Prisons, we do not practice solitary confinement. In, in my oral testimony and my written testimony, our practice has always been to ensure that when individuals are placed in restrictive housing, we place them in a cell with another individual. To also include that our staff make periodic rounds to check on the individuals. 
And I also believe it is important. And I'm sorry, I just really need to be clear on that. Your, your testimony to me right now is that the BOP does not practice solitary confinement of individuals singularly in, in, in a, a confined uh, area. You're correct. We only place an individual in a cell alone if we have good evidence to believe that the individual could cause harm to another individual and or if we have our medical or mental health staff given the evaluation that it would be a benefit to the individual to be placed in a cell alone. We do not under any circumstances, nor have we ever had a practice of placing individuals in a cell alone. Okay, that's astonishing to me, um, and I'd love to, to explore that further, because all the evidence that I have is that it is a practice at the federal level. So, so you're telling me that there are not people that are being held for many, many months alone in, in, in solitary confinement. Is that correct? When you look at the Bureau of Prisons agency-wide, that is not a practice, which we have three forms. We have our SHU special housing units, which are the majority of the individuals throughout the country placed in restrictive housing. We also have a program we So in the SHU, which SHU. Uh, they're, they're, they're not individually held? No, sir. And on average, agency-wide, the average amount of time that individuals are spending, on average, again, total, is a little more than 65 days. And so the SHU is not solitary confinement. They're not an individual in a cell alone. That is not the practice in the Bureau of Prisons. Never has been the practice. I hope there'll be another round. Senator McCaskill. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Samuels, what percentage of the inmates that you're responsible for have been convicted of a violent crime in the federal courts? Convicted of a federal crime in Of the a violent crime. Violent crime. Give me a second. Approximately 5%. Okay, so we've got 5% violent, 95% nonviolent. I, I think the thing that people need to understand, which I'm not sure people do, is that the 5% that committed violent crimes, um, you don't even have primary jurisdiction probably on most of those crimes in the federal system. I don't think people realize that the federal law enforcement system was not designed or ever intended to address what most people think of as crime in this country. It was originally intended to be just for those kinds of crimes that because of the interstate nature of them, they needed to be handled by the federal government. That would be crimes involving the inner drugs going from country to country. Then eventually we started nibbling away at that and we started doing bank robbers and then we started doing interstate kidnappings or interstate, and I know this because, you know, we handled a whole lot of murder cases when I was the prosecutor in Kansas City, and nothing was more irritating to me. We had the best homicide detectives, I believe, in the Midwest in the Kansas City Police Department. We had experienced prosecutors who handled murders every day, and invariably when there was a really high-profile murder case, all of a sudden the FBI would start sniffing around and try to grab that case and find some kind of interstate part of the crime so that they would take the case as opposed to us who handled murder cases all the time and frankly, in my opinion, biased as it may be, had much more expertise. I say all this because you're spending seven billion dollars and 95 percent of that money is being sent on nonviolent offenders. That's an astounding number on nonviolent offenders. An astounding number. So my question is, how many times have you been brought into the policy questions of who is being prosecuted in the federal system and why? Because you guys don't get 911 calls. Nobody calls the FBI with a 911 call. I used to make the point to my friends who were FBI agents, hey, they didn't call you, they called us. And they, so the federal system gets to pick what they, this is not required. They get to decide what they want to prosecute, unlike state prosecutors who have to make a decision on every single case. 
So are you ever called into the policy discussions about the growth of federal law enforcement and this massive amount of prosecution that's going on and the growth in the prison system? Because these decisions are being dictated by the Department of Justice in how many cases they're actually filing. Are you ever consulted on any of those decisions? Senator McCaskill, I would offer that the Bureau of Prisons, when the discussions are taking place, we are brought into the discussion when needed by the department. But I also would share, which I'm sure you're aware that for any policy decisions relative to who is being prosecuted, that remains with my colleagues in the department who would be more than anyone else regarding this issue capable of responding to that. So let's get at the stuff that you can do. Let's talk about the elderly offender program. Um, the way you entered into um, some of the contracts, you didn't specify out what the cost of home detention was versus your detention, correct? In other words, what you did is you didn't, you weren't able in the pilot, isn't this correct, Mr. Horwitz, that they weren't able to discern what a release into home detention was costing versus incarceration in one of the prison facilities? That's correct. That, the GAO found that in their review. Correct. Pilot. So you aren't in a position that you can even analyze what the cost of a home detention program versus prison would be, correct? Well, since that time, once the finding was made, we've been working to isolate those costs. Okay, and how are you doing that? We've put together procedures within our administration division, the staff who are responsible for the contracting oversight to monitor. Okay. Um, there were 784 of the 855 applicants for the elderly release program that were denied. 784 out of 855 were denied. Uh, can you explain why they were denied that massive amount? And these are all elderly. These are not young people. I can take your concern back, but from the knowledge that I have regarding this, many of those individuals, it was dealing with the issue of being eligible based on the criteria that was put in place. Who sets the criteria? The criteria for the pilot? Yeah, who said it? That was established by Congress. So we're the ones that said that if it's a low-level offender that got an 18-month sentence, they couldn't go to a home program unless they'd served 18 months? Well, the department was involved with the final determination on what the criteria would be, but that was something that was done through conversation between department and members of Congress. Well, I would love to know who was in on that conversation if you would provide that to the committee. Um, and I'd like to see the criterion because if you've got 95% of your population is nonviolent and you've got, um, we know that the recidivism rate for people over the age of 55 is somewhere between two and 3%. By the way, that's a recidivism rate that any reentry program or any drug court program or any state court system would die for. That is an amazingly low recidivism rate. I, I do not understand how we cannot even, we're turning down 784 of 855 applicants for a pilot program. So it seems to me that the institution is being stubbornly stuck in the status quo. Stubbornly stuck in the status quo. And I am so excited that we have critical mass around here as somebody who um, against a lot of political headwinds, started one of the first drug courts in the country as an elected prosecutor. Um, I convinced the people in my community and the police department that a drug court was a taxpayer factory because the people who went into drug court were either on welfare or they were stealing. They weren't paying taxes, and all the nonviolent crimes they were committing was because they were drug addicted. And that drug court movement, ours began in 1990. Three, it's spread all over the country and the world because it works so well. You know what I had to, I begged the federal government to participate in our drug court program. Didn't want to hear a word about it. I couldn't even get them to send us their mules, the girlfriend mules. They wouldn't even send us those for our, I mean, I was saying, let me take your cases, your low-level drug offender cases. Wouldn't hear of it in the 90s. 
And I'm just not sure that we've moved that much in the Department of Justice, and I hope we can all work together. I know my time's up. I've got some questions. I would love, um, I have some questions for the record about Reeves County, that contract. Why in the world are we using a county as a go-between on a prison contract? And also um, these, these uh, criminal alien prisons that we have, that half of them are immigration offenses. And I'm curious about the $1 billion price tag on that. So I'll get you those questions for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator McCaskill. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, I think we're finding another area of agreement here. Uh, you know, the federal government getting involved in something that, from my standpoint, is better left to the states and, and local governments because they're just better at it. They're, they're closer to it. Uh, they use a little more common sense approach. So, you know, I've, I've frequently said Washington, D.C., the federal government uh, definition of is the law of negative unintended consequences, and I think we're seeing a lot of that here today. Again, not, not because of good intentions and not because people are working hard and, and sacrificing, but I think that's just basically true. Uh, I want to be respectful of the witnesses' times. I know Senator Booker had another question here. I'm happy to do that, but let's, let's not abuse the, the, the time. No, I'm grateful. I, and I think we're having semantic problems, Mr. Director. So the DOJ defines solitary confinement as the terms isolation or solitary confinement mean the state of being confined to one cell or uh, uh, for approximately 22 hours per day or more alone or with other prisoners. The, the health consequences for solitary confinement period uh, are, are well uh, alerted. And this is a common practice in the federal system, but, but it's not just with other prisoners. In the SHU, often in uh, prisoners, in the special manage, management units, uh, it's, it's, it's common as well, and the average stay in, in that is 277 days. And in the ADX, or the administrative maximum prisons, the average solitary confinement is 1,376 days. So this is, this is a real problem, and it does exist. Uh, and forgive me if my semantics were wrong, but I think I've got more precision now. No, sir, and I did want to clarify, and I appreciate you bringing this subject uh, back for that at the ADX, and when I testified in 2012, at that time we had a little more than 400 inmates at the ADX in Florence, Colorado, which makes up less than one-third of one percent of our entire population. And for that population, those individuals are placed in single cell. And the majority of that population, also when you look at their offenses, 46 percent have been involved in some homicide at some point in their, in their uh, lives. Again, but, but the reality is, is that, that the, the actual result, I don't care if it's a homicide, nonviolent drug crime, what are we getting for taxpayers for putting them in, a, in a, an environment in which human rights folks consider that uh, uh, torture? And, and we have a medical community that has a consensus about torture. And so, so or the, the harmful, excuse me, traumatizing effect of that. And, and so what I'm just saying is, and, and again, the, 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 the crime, violent, nonviolent, I'm just saying that this is a nation that doesn't endorse torture or believe that we should traumatize folks. And if there's no data that supports us actually having something positive coming out of this, it, it's got to be a practice that we've, we, we should end or severely limit. And that's what I'm just saying. I'm trying to do a data-driven approach, relying on experts in science. And just because I want to stay on the good side of the chairman, I'm going to shift off of this issue because I have enough questions to last another 10 minutes, and I don't think I'm going to get that. I will, I will tread upon his, no, uh, you're not. his indulgences as long as possible. So, um, so just real quick, uh, um, a real quick point. Uh, Federal Bureau of Prison houses 14,500 women. Um, uh, as we talked about in the last panel, uh, overwhelmingly these women have children, children of uh, under a minor age. Um, the the tr trauma visited upon children and those, those often the primary caregivers, there's a lot of issues. And so I just want to get to this one reality that in Danbury, Connecticut, which is a mere 70 miles away from the New York City area, I like to call it the greater Newark area, um, and it, which is an easy reach for visitors from the Northeast. That's going to be changed, and those women are going to now be moved, uh, 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 slated right now to move to Alabama to a facility there, which is about 1,000 miles away from the greater Newark area, a drive that takes more than 16 hours. Um, and so, you know, why w was the 500-mile policy enacted, in which, we, which is a good thing, which is uh, something I endorse, 
uh, due to the cost of travel for families, would you commit to re revising the rule to have a presumption of, of 75 miles and possible, 75 miles if possible? Do you, do you understand? Yes. Is, is there a chance to revise that rule? Senator, when, when we looked at the mission change for, for Danbury, we made every effort to try to make sure through fairness for those offenders who not only were living in the New England states or as far as their residents, but we had many offenders there who were from California, who were from Texas. And what we tried to do is make sure that with the realignment that we move those individuals who were not from that part of the country so they could be closer to their and family. So we're, we're taking care of the Californians, but there are a lot of people from the Northeast, a lot of women with small children who are having those connections uh, effectively severed, and that is, that is very problematic. I'm just going to shift for now, uh, if I can, and I apologize. Uh, um, uh, just want to quickly just uh, uh, look at the private prison issue uh, real quick and shift to Mr. Horowitz if I can. I don't want you to feel like I was ignoring you in this hearing. Um, are you concerned about the growth of private prisons uh, that contract with the BOP? And, and what have you endured that these prisons are accountable to the public? Because we have uh, real issues with these contracts, which with a total of uh, costing us about $5.1 billion for taxpayers. Uh, and these are for-profit companies that, according to the Sentencing Project, 33,830 BOP prisoners were held in private facilities in 2010, and by the end of 2011, that, that number has grown significantly to over 38,000. And I'm concerned about uh, oversight, and, and, and then there's a, a lack of reporting information that's just, I can get a lot of information easily from the prisons that are being run uh, uh, by the director. But there is this, this unbelievable, uh, uh, really offensive to me, lack of information and data about our private prisons and what's going on there. And, and, and so I, I want to last part of that question, then I'll, and then I'm done, uh, just wait for the answer, is, is, is the abuse reports mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of immigrant detainees. Mm -hmm. um, now, I understand these folks are... Uh, not American citizens, but they are human beings. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the, uh, the, the report of, of abuse at our private prisons are troubling. Thousands of men live in 200-foot in Kevlar tents uh, in some of these uh, facilities that each house about 200 men. The, 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 the facilities are described as filthy, insect-infested, uh, uh, horrible smells, old, constantly overflowing toilets, um, um, this is an affront for this nation, for what we stand for. For me, it's an affront. And I'm just wondering what steps are you taking uh, to hold these prisons accountability and to lift the veil that protects the American public from knowing what's doing, being done with billions of their taxpayer dollars? We've, we're taking several steps, Senator. Um, we issued the report on the Reeves County uh, facility uh, earlier this year, focusing on that particular private prison. Some of the issues we found there were of concern, much like you've just mentioned. Um, staffing levels, for example, um, as you know, Reeves County had a riot several years ago. One of the issues was supposedly staffing levels. We looked and saw had concerns about staffing. We had concerns about the billing and the contracting practices. Uh, we made a variety of recommendations in that. Uh, as to that facility, we're currently looking at the Adams County facility in Mississippi, Leavenworth in Kansas. Uh, private prisons, as well as a broader review looking at the BOP's monitoring of overall uh, the contract prisons, because that is an issue of concern um, as the spending has increased um, and the number of prisoners has gone from 2 percent to 20 percent of the, of the overall federal prison population. That's an issue of concern. Um, so we're doing those reviews. Um, several of the contract prisons, like Reeves, like Adams, like the Willacy facility, Northeast Correctional Center in Ohio, have all had riots um, in the last several years. Um, those are contract prisons being used by the BOP, and it has raised the concerns that we're looking at closely. And, and why not better reporting? Why can't I or, or the public get the same kind of transparency in reporting that we would get with the uh, uh, prisons that are directly under the purview of, Dr. of Director Samuels? And that's something we're looking at as well, because it's, it's an issue both we're looking at what kind of reporting the BOP is getting from these institutions. In addition, what kind of information is flowing and is accessible, and why aren't we doing more? Why is more being done to be transparent about that? 
Th th thank you, Senator Booker. And, and you can have my personal assurances that I will continue to work with you personally. We'll continue to use this, this committee to you know, highlight these issues and work towards solutions. Uh, I think this is, this is an important issue. I, I want to thank, again, both you gentlemen for your service to, to this nation, uh, for your thoughtful testimony. I want to thank all the witnesses. I think we, I think we really did accomplish uh, my primary goal of every hearing, again, is lay out the reality. Uh, let, let's admit we have a problem. We've got one here. I'm not saying we've got the real ready solutions, but we certainly have, uh, you know, we've taken that first step and we've admitted we've got the problem. So with that, uh, the hearing record will remain open for 15 days until May 14th at 5 p.m. for the submission of statements and questions for the record. This hearing is adjourned.